My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Receive from the bounties of your blessings. We ask, Lord, that you will instruct us by your word, that you will empower us by the witness of your spirit. At every one of us, we realize the full scope of our ordinations, the burdens that you put upon our spirits, the graces that we have received on account of your finished works, the strategy of the spirit that is required in order to maximize the potentials of the spirit we have received. That at the end, Lord, your kingdom may be established your dominion may appear and reign in our midst and your name be glorified take all the glory father in the precious name of jesus christ hallelujah you may be seated god bless you it's to seven that means we've been in God's presence for over six hours. We'll take this last, this last layer. See, we are, we are in a strategic season. And the emphasis of God in this season cannot be exaggerated. In fact, we need the help of the Spirit to communicate it in its full potentials. To the extent that it should be com communicated, we will need the help of God to communicate it. For those that are discerning in the spirit, we know that it's a transition period. And on the strength of what God wants to do, He is bringing new burdens to the heart of men, exposing men to new layers of dealings, so that that which is locked up on their inside can find expression. And in transition season, sometimes our relationship with God becomes a relationship that is characterized by many kinds of laws. It becomes so rigid because God wants to purge us in the process. In order to be able to handle the substances of divinity that will be released upon the earth realm. In a day of migration, it's very important for everybody to become very careful to follow God very closely because in the unveiling of the dispensation that is coming whether you will be relevant or not is dependent on your degree of yielding and yieldedness to the Holy Spirit charisma will not suffice skills will not suffice it is the extent to which God is walked into you that will determine what he will commit to you in the days to come and this is why we keep emphasizing the fact and the need for consecration, the need for submission, the need for complete and absolute yielding to the Holy Spirit. Because until His government becomes real to our souls, it will be impossible to host His dimensions. The Bible says, when God shall build up Zion, then He shall appear in His glory. We have seen men of great stature and ranking in the spirit that have hosted different dimensions in God. They've maximized these dimensions and they've built institutions out of it as a testament of the fact that the hand of God was upon their lives. But when we look upon the territories, when we look upon the systems of the world, the institutions of the world, we realize that darkness has permeated the borders of our habitation. So we begin to wonder what is the impact 
act of the revival that the Lord released upon the landscape in the last generation. Our churches have become bigger. The numbers have become more. The anointing, very potent dimensions and manifestations of the Spirit are very, very alarming. But the souls of men are still lean. Meanwhile, the idea in the heart of God is kingdom. If truly God is poured upon us, how is it that when we go to the schools, we go to the markets, we go to the hospitals, the things we see is characteristic of demonic entities. When you go to the campuses, it's a picture and a portrait of Hades. Why does it look as if Jezebel is coronated in all our campuses, whereas the anointing of God is moving? Why has it become so difficult for us to uninstall the powers of principalities that takes over territories? Even though we are raising cripples, we are opening blind eyes, and we are receiving seeds in millions. Why is it impossible to come into a territory and then you can look upon the people and say of, of the truth, Christ is truly glorified. The Bible spoke in the days of the patriarchs of old. He said they looked upon them in Antioch and he said these ones are little Christ. The lifestyle of people, the government of the day, had no choice but to bow to the authority that was steaming and being trafficked by the life of these people from Zion. So much so that the Bible will record that these be the men that turned their walls upside down. They had power to shut down religion. He said even the priests became obedient to the faith. They had power to alter the philosophies of men. They had power to uproot government. How come in our day and time, everything we see God do is only in the church? Meanwhile, the principalities are no longer interested in our meetings. You know, those days when you come for vigils, they send their agents to, to disrupt what God is doing because everything that is done in the church, the ripple effect is manifested in the territory. But nowadays, we carry out all the activities we carry out and the territory is weak. If you took a census today of preachers, that are locked down by immorality and all forms of addiction, you'll be amazed. Not the brethren yet. Why have we become weak? Why is it that we are doing so much yet our corporate ranking does not sustain the stature to affect the territory? God's servant was in just recently when the prophet of God came from India and when he entered the land, he said he came with a message. That even the army that God wants to raise is already compromised. Most of the people that by ordination have been elected to be part of this army. Somehow, the principalities by intelligence have used their radar to find out the people that their stars are already shining in heaven. And they have corrupted them with immorality. Meanwhile, the alarm in Zion is just sounding. The number have not been completed. The army have not been, been picked out. But by by powers of astrology and all kinds of intelligence they know the ones that the hand of God is upon and they are already choking their lives and they are corrupting the power and the purity of the spirit of God in their soul most of them are already bound to all kinds of addictions and immorality and a man came in from India and instantly he picked it that the army is already compromised meanwhile we have many people giving word of knowledge and nobody can discern what is happening in the territory. Sometimes I wonder, the gospel we are preaching, are we picking it from heaven? Or we are reshuffling messages to preach so that we can sound novel? How is it that within the very borders of our own habitation, we cannot discern what God is doing? We cannot tell and know what darkness is trafficking and the negative impact that is going on already. Meanwhile, somebody just stepped into our borders and he discerned. That the people that are numbered are already being compromised. These burdens, they are the reason why we keep crying. We may not be popular. They may fight us down. They may succeed. Because a point came when the head of John was cut off. But what God wanted to achieve was to allow for the Messiah to enter into the territory. And his cry was sufficient to bring the Messiah. The Bible said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm. 
upon his holy mountains. How come our Deborahs are in the clubs? How come our Mordecaias are given to Yahoo Yahoo? How come the people that should hold the scepter of authority, they are already being choked by all kinds of pleasure and desires? Even in our corporate assembly, when you come, you see all kinds of pride and flesh. Somebody is preaching flesh, whereas everything you are seeing is flesh. Because he heard another preacher talk about flesh. Three of us gather and it's all about competition. You can't give rope. Because this one gave the testimony of what God did. All the messages that day is about the testimony of their impact. God needs to help us. God needs to help us. I want to share something this evening. At least the ones that we are able to contact. The Bible says, Iron sharpened iron as a man the countenance of his friend. The ones we are able to interact with. We will keep creating that alarm in our spirit so that there will be an awakening. And then we will be able to yield to that rigid government that comes to our soul. Most times it's difficult. You may think it's favor that makes men to rise. Favor plays a part in it. But if men don't show you their scars and the sacrifices that they have, you may not understand. Because for a man to break through in this realm, he must have conquered thrones. Because there are powers that ensure that you don't lift up your head. And for a man to speak for God in this kingdom, in the midst of the plethora of forces that want to shut down the move of God, you understand that that man has tasted of death. And this is why we will keep emphasizing the things we are emphasizing. There are many things to share. We can teach the doctrine of prosperity. We can teach the doctrine of healing. But we know that to be relevant, our soul must come under the government of Zion. I told you God is not against prosperity. God is not against influence. But in every move of God, that's the last thing God gives. A move of God begins with a cry. And as men repent and turn to the Lord, then he begins to bring encounters. And those encounters reveal to them who they are in God and the strategic role they will have to play for the thing that is in the mind of the Father, locked up in the heights of the heavens to find expression in the earth realm. It's when men repent and come under that government, that is where encounters that can affect territory are given to men. The Bible said Moses, when he was come of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of Egypt, which is but for a season. For that reason, Moses decided to depart from the palace and he went to the back sides of the desert. God didn't answer him. He was separated for 40 years. It is after 40 years that Moses, somehow by the Holy Ghost, his feet was guided to, to the back side of the desert. So Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years. He could not find the mountain of Horeb because Horeb was a ground where an encounter that would create deliverance of a people that have been in bondage for 430 years will take place. You don't find Horeb. You can receive a vision about many things, but encounters that can change the land, they only come when your soul comes under government. 40 years for the guy to find Horeb. I was wondering, Horeb is a mountain. How can you be for, in that place for 40 years and you only came to Horeb after 40 years? Because God needed him to break every tendency of royalty that we constitute a blockade to what God wanted to do, needed to be chiseled out of his soul. And it took 40 years for Moses to come to that point when he became a servant. Until God will give witness concerning him and said, it's the meekest of all men that is. And Bishop had died. In Exodus 32, verse 32, God said he will wipe out Israel. The God that gave covenant through Abraham, and he watched that covenant jealously. He said he will wipe out Israel and start a new generation with Moses. Moses cried and told God to repent. Ambition had died. So he was not in what he was doing for what he could gain. At that time, the guy had power to judge princes in darkness. Hope you know when God came to deliver Israel from Egypt, it was not Pharaoh God was dealing with. In Exodus 12 verse 12, God said, I will come down to Egypt and I will judge the gods of Egypt. 
In Exodus 7 verse 1, God said to Moses, Behold, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. So the man that can activate the dimension, that can un, un, unravel the mystery of the Leviathan that was in the belly of the ocean, needed to die to everything that has to do with human proclivities and tendencies. When he died, he was a servant among the immortals, but on earth he was a, a god to the kings of this world. So Moses could stand and challenge Leviathan because God had worked something in him. If we don't come under that government and allow God to purge us and we begin to pursue the blessings that come with revival, those blessings will be the very things that will corrupt us. It is influence that corrupt men. It is fame that corrupt men. It is money that corrupt men. Because they come to a point where they touch powers that their soul cannot handle. Because they have not been built. He said, when God shall build up Zion, then he shall appear in his glory. You don't know the powers that come with revival. Revival is not people falling down. The Bible said, time will fail me to speak of Gideon, to speak of Barak, to speak of Jephthah, to speak of Samuel, David, and the prophet. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. When revival comes, it doesn't go for people. It goes to challenge kingdoms and paradigms, status quo. He alters it. A power that can arrest a government. A power that can arrest an institution. It's not a power that a man can handle. Until that man sustains the disposition of an immortal. He cannot wield that kind of power without corruption. Who through faith subdued kingdom? They rattled the foundations of their territory. He said men who were weak became valiant in strength. They shut the mouths of lions and they put to flight the armies of the aliens. And in that height of exploit, even when they needed to die, death meant nothing to them. The Bible said even this world is not worthy for their names to be mentioned. If you want to find out the stature of those men, wait until Zion appears. Then you will see the men that are truly mighty in God. Because they allowed God, God to break them. God broke them to a point where they had encounters. And on the strength of those encounters, they entered into rooms of power. And when they spake, kings bowed. That is when influence and money becomes a tool. Because if God doesn't deal with you enough to break you, the money that comes to your hand will become the reason why you are irrelevant in Zion. So we don't begin in transition season by talking about prosperity. We talk death. Because only dead men can handle glory. Money will come, influence will come, fame will come, power will come. The miraculous will be our bread. But we will die first. Because when those things come, they are supposed to be tools that will sponsor the fire to the end of the earth. The reason why money, fame and influence came and the territory was not affected is because these men don't understand that revival ends with mission. It doesn't end with encounter. It doesn't end with prosperity. The oil boom came, but the oil boom is not the goal. The oil boom is a tool to, fast track, to facilitate and to sponsor the fire to the nations. But the oil boom became the reason why our priorities became about cathedrals and about so many other things. Kadosh, you are mighty on your throne. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, there are things we must do to be relevant. Relevance. It's not necessarily the noise we are making on earth. I told you yesterday. Relevance is not even about the skill, the gifts, and the abilities you have on earth. Relevance is actually dependent on your degree of consistency with what was written concerning you. I was sharing with them in bias. I told them, you can have a good voice and you think it's about melody. And because you see people are jumping crying you don't know why that voice was given to you people may be building their voice by doing voice training your own developing of your voice may be fasting and prayer because your voice is supposed to be a system of resonance in the spirit so that every time you lift your voice the energy of heaven will come to earth and it will remain on the strength of that energy ten prophets may rise 
You are not a father in the body of Christ, but you came to a meeting and you sang. And because you sang, ten prophets left that meeting. And their life, a revival begins. That's the dimension I told you that men like Lawrence began to reveal to us. You come for a meeting and suddenly you just chant. As you chant, everybody is drunk with the Holy Spirit. We didn't see that dimension before. Meanwhile, we clapped hands for many people and many albums were waxed. But people didn't catch fire because the full potential of sound was not realized. And then you may watch them, you think it's about skill, so you go and do voice training. You may hear the chant and master it and recite the same chant. But the more you chant, <laughs> you don't know that to enter into that energy level in Zion, it may take you five years of crying on the altar. So what came out broke out of you. Not because you have a good voice. It's something that broke out of you. Men become relevant when they understand the protocol of death. I didn't plan to talk about concentration, but since you say I should talk about concentration, I will touch it a bit. I will talk about concentration and then I will hit my note on one of the precursors of spiritual concentration. Because the truth is, if we don't concentrate enough, we will not be relevant. We may get to a point where we flow with the wind of revival. And then we are known because we, we are part of a chariot. But we'll be shocked. Hope you know Jesus is chariot followed Jesus for three and a half years. He was part of them. When Jesus sent them out, he went and he did signs and wonders. Meanwhile, there was something in his heart that was not dealt with. At the end of the day, he was the one that sold Jesus. How can a man who was with Jesus for three and a half years become the son of perdition? Meanwhile, there were 500 other people that didn't have the privilege of being among the twelve. The guy went as far as becoming part of the twelve. Authorities invested in him. He went into territory and he challenged darkness. But at the end of the day, what was in his heart, he didn't deal with it until he became the tool that the devil used. He never knew that all the while that he was working with Jesus, he was an agent of darkness. Because darkness was not about the manifestation. It was about the state of his heart. So long as that heart is there, the devil will allow you. Become mighty first. That is when your fall will be colossal. So you are part of what is happening. Everybody is hearing your name. They are hailing you. The devil is waiting. Because what he wants to do, he needs a ripple effect that will shut down every other voice that wants to come up. Because when they see what happened to you, they will become afraid. So you are rising, the devil allows you. The devil can even call. You come for a meeting, you lift your hand like this. He cooperates with all the demons and they are screaming. And you say, oh, I have power. Don't check the manifestation. Look at your heart. What is happening in your heart is what will determine where you will go. How far you will go is not a function of what is happening on ground. It's what's happening on your, in your heart. Hope you know when Jesus came to cast out demons, they said he casted out demons by Beelzebub. Because the people understand that there is a place in spiritual dynamics where demons cooperate with themselves in order to deceive men. If the heart have not come under the government of God, you are not part of the army that God is raising. Where we take is not the manifestation, it's the heart. That's where the calibrator is. If you cannot find that alignment in your heart, ah, if you are popular, it's a risk. Because it will become dangerous for you to come back and settle the matters of concentration. The devil will lead you until you go very high and he will cut you off. Concentration. It's too important. I didn't know how the fathers taught their own Bible those days. That people who were drunkards, homosexuals, adulterers, they came to church, they cried. And then they gave everything to God. And then, it's not this one we do in every crusade. They submit everything to God. And then you look at the life of that brother. After five years, he's still standing and burning. Sometimes I wonder how they preached. What was it that they preached? Meanwhile, they were still prospering. They were still walking in signs and wonder, but their life was pure. They were holy men. Those were the days when people walked into beer palace, walked into brothels, and they won souls to Christ. And then you will know somebody in your area who is a drunk, suddenly is now carrying Bible to church every day, and he remains like that until you grow up. 
Now we come to church with his blue. Everybody is rolling out the floor. How come our gospel can no longer touch the heart of men? He said, Peter spoke and 3,000 people were pricked in their heart. Meanwhile, Peter didn't talk about salvation. He only narrated what happened. How that the same Jesus that they killed is now crucified and is made Lord and Christ. And then they are hearing him in their heart. I thought he was speaking Aramaic. And then their own response to him is, what shall we do to be saved? What was he saying? And then in one day, 3,000 people rose and they stood. Another day, 5,000 rose. Now we reshuffle people. They attend one meeting here. The same people migrate to another meeting. The same people migrate to another meeting. And the same people are the ones who are doing all the other atrocities. I said in Lagos, when they arrest 70 people, if you check, one is Christian, the other one is Peter, the other one is Paul, the other one is Jacob. We are not teaching you know, until people are truly transformed. We are not teaching. We are just talking. If people can't come under the government of God, we are not teaching. We may clap hands for ourselves and wow ourselves because we are speaking big English and talking articulate terms and doing doctrinal exegesis that you excite people doesn't mean they are transformed. Anybody can be excited. There are many things you want to hear. If I tell you what you want to hear, you will jump. But you will jump and go back. The principality has nothing to do with your excitement. That's why you masturbate, you cry, you still masturbate. He's interested in keeping your soul under government. His idea is not about the excitement. You are celebrating. When you commit the sin, you go back, you cry, you come back. The guy is only interested in government. He doesn't, he's not moved about your emotion. But when we come to church now, we check emotion. The rather is emotion. So when you are talking and people are, hey, 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 then your faith becomes strengthened. Or when you say, Lord, the Lord wants to do something, and you see one person doing like this. Then your faith jacks up. Jehovah needs to help us. There is nothing wrong with these things in themselves. It is God working. But we must seek to press deeper if we are truly interested in people. The way the apostles did it, they were not interested in glory. They were interested in seeing God in the people. Let's begin from Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible said in Ephesians 4, 11, so when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. He said, to some he gave to be apostles. To some he gave to be prophets. To some he gave to be evangelists. Pastors and teachers. Four. So the reason the offices were given is beginning to reveal it. The reason the offices were given is not for signs and wonders. The reason the offices were given is not for healing the sick. The reason the offices were given is not for prosperity. The reason the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists also do signs and wonders. One is because they are believers and every believer is entitled to working in signs and wonders. Two, their offices support them when there is a need. But primarily, the reason the offices are given, the Bible said one, for perfecting the saints. That means the idea of the office is to make the hearer become like Christ. If the hearer becomes like Christ, one, his needs will be met. Two, he will become relevant in the hand of God. For the perfecting, the word perfecting is the Greek word katadismos. It means to equip with light. So that the person who came, he may come as a sinner. But as he came and he looked at Jesus because your skill is your ability to paint Jesus to the person. So that as he beholds Jesus, as he beholds that perfect law of liberty, he came as a harlot. But what he will suddenly see in the mirror you have painted is an evangelist. So as he's leaving your meeting, he came as a harlot. But he's going with a new gamut of an evangelist. So he came for your meeting. You may not even have told him to go and preach to the sick. But when he looked at Jesus, he now saw his own dimension. And that dimension begins to cry out. So he leaves that meeting. Suddenly, he can't sleep anymore. The guy who was weak and said, I can't pray. He just heard you. And then while he was yet listening to you, he's speaking in tongues. 
And then what you will discover is that his gaze will turn away from you and he will turn to Jesus. Because when he hears you, he will be hearing beyond the voice of a man. He will hear Jesus crying to the womb of his spirit. And then suddenly, a new come from his inside. His confidence, his proclivities, his tendencies and priorities will change. He was listening to you, but after a while, he began to hear echoes from Zion. He doesn't know when he was in the line. He doesn't know when he starts talking. And then he leaves that place. The first thing he wants to do is to please the will of Jesus. And then suddenly, every day, doing the work of God becomes his priority. Because what has happened? You have equipped him with light. Because it is the believer that does the work of the ministry, not the fivefold. The fivefold is to bring the believer into the awareness of who they are. They are the ones that go out to do the work of the ministry. That's why Jesus said to them that believe, He said they should what? Lay hands on the sick, the sick will recover. Now, that does not exonerate the fivefold from doing the work of the ministry because they are also believers. But if the work of the fivefold is done well, the first thing that happens is that the believer will find his own identity in Christ. And then on the strength of what he has discovered, a new energy enters him. And then he begins to live accordingly. Secondly, he now takes up the body of the work of the ministry. He begins to perpetually live his life to serve the will of the Father. He may not know why he's doing it, but a new kind of life has entered him. Because what you are revealing to him is the life of the Christ. And then thirdly, the Bible said he grows in the fullness of the stature of Christ. So the more he hears you, the more he becomes like Jesus. The more he hears you, the more he becomes like Jesus. Until a point come, he becomes the Jesus of his world. So he enters his village, he enters his family. Every dimension that Jesus would have revealed because he was listening to you, he becomes that dimension to his family. He becomes that dimension to his world. But there are requirements. This is why we have many ranking apostles, many ranking prophets. But things are not going the way they should. Because people are not exposed to truth. We have become philosophers. I'm telling you, we have become philosophers. We are very good with wars. We are very skillful, but we can't talk to the heart of men. We have become philosophers. Therefore, and testify in the law that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, having their understanding. Darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. So Paul is contrasting the believer with the Gentile. He said, the wants to erode every form of vanity that is in your heart. The Bible said, he that liveth for pleasure is dead even while he walketh. The vanity in your heart, if you come under the word of God and it is not removed, Paul said you are walking like the Gentiles. And because you are walking like that, he said your understanding is darkened. You can't understand what God wants you to do. Every time God brings an it will be here. And then you are crying that you don't have strength. Your problem is not strength. Because the same person who is crying of an inability to do the will of God is doing other things many, many more hours than the things of God. Because of the vanity that is in the heart. The word that they hear cannot pierce through their soul to challenge their paradigms. The guy came to church and it's the same principles of prosperity that is taught in a business school that the pastor now perfects and is teaching the guy. Meanwhile, the duty of the man of God is to reveal Jesus to him first. It is the same principle of success that we perfect that we are teaching people. 
So now you don't even need to encounter Jesus to be an apostle. All you need to do is to study wide and gather enough information and be a master of, of, of speech power. And then if you come, you teach the same people the same thing. If it's prosperity I want to learn, I will gather money and go to Netherlands Business School and I will do better. Because the last time I checked Forbes top 50 richest men, I didn't see any man of God there. We are weak. You know, Paul who taught grace is the same person that is emphasizing these things. So when he listed the fivefold, they began to show us matters of priorities. There is a place for prosperity. But prosperity is a tool in your hand. And the only time you can see prosperity as a tool is when your heart has come under the government of God. A man who is not consecrated to God is a man living for pleasure. And everything you give him, he lavish it on his pleasure. It can be relevant with God. We are talking revival. Everybody is shouting revival. Everybody is shouting revival. A man that cannot make any commitment to God is talking revival. Because we are a part of a prayer meeting. And then we come for the prayer meeting, we are all shouting. Paul turned to the believer and in verse 20 said, But we have not so learned Christ. We have not so learned Christ. If we are still walking based on the vanity in our heart, they say we have not learned Christ. But for those who have learned Christ, this is what Paul said, If so be that ye have heard him, if truly you say you have heard him, if what you say you heard is Christ you heard, and you have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, he said that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. So any man that have not put off the old man, you have not heard Jesus. You may have heard a lot of doctrines. You may have heard a lot of philosophies. Not Jesus you heard. He said, if it be that it is Jesus you have heard, what you will do first is that you will put off the old man. You will remove, you will strip yourself of the old man. And he said, you will put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. True holiness. A holiness that is palpable and can be seen. A man who has not put up the old man and won Christ, he has no place in Zion. He has no relevance in the kingdom. Paul writing to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 19, he said, the standard of God standeth sure. He said, therefore, they that name the name of the Lord, what should they do? He didn't say they should prosper. He didn't say they should be healthy. These things, there are priorities. The same way the spirit is superior to the soul, the soul is superior to the body, and the body is superior to circumstances. That is the same way truth has priorities and ranking. He said, if you have named the name of the Lord, what do you do? Depart from iniquity. For in a great house, great house there are many vessels. He says, some of gold, some of silver, some of wood, and some of earth. He says, some unto honor, and some unto dishonor. So you can be a child of God, and you are unto dishonor. I hear a lot of things. They say, I'm, say, I'm accepted in Christ. Everything I'm accepted. Go back and read Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 to 3. He said, I beseech you therefore, dearly below, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and accepted. There's an acceptance that is a legal term. There's an acceptance that is an experiential term. A man who does not live a life of holiness, God cannot commit anything to him to represent him because he will become a reproach to the name of the Lord. That's why you hear all kinds of news online. They say they caught a pastor doing this. And people say, Pastor! A man who God has not dealt with cannot represent God. Because we are not preachers, we are witnesses. 
The only thing is that sometimes we witness through preaching, but we are not preachers. If we are preachers, what we need is oratory. But if we are witnesses, the life of the spirit that we represent, we should communicate it. John said that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That is what we commit to you. You have not traveled deep in God to catch his reality, to touch his essence, and you think by talking about it, people can become it. And then the same error is being passed down. Somebody rises after three days, he goes on Facebook, and because he has a platform on Facebook, he's an apostle, he's a prophet, an evangelist, he's posting things online. And everybody misleading everybody. The more you hear them, the more you fall. In 1 Thessalonians 2 8, he says, For that we love you. We have not only committed the gospel to you, but the substance of our soul. So the more they heard him, the more they became like him, because he has become a channel for conducting God. You can't do the business of God except first of all you have been apprehended by it. Because your soul is a gateway into the soul of the one that hears you. The gospel is not for education. It's a, a transference of life and spirit. Jesus said the words I speak unto you. He said they are spirits. They are life. You may be educated in the process. But what I'm trying to do is to conduct my dimension into you. And the thing that you call. That's why you see people go for crusade. They return as immoral people. Because consecration, consecration is no longer a heavy molecule in our doctrine. In the days of the apostles, sometimes they set apart three months and they are praying for purging. Because they understood the place of sanctification and they understood the place of justification. Justification is what Jesus did for you to be acceptable in God. Sanctification is your response to justification. Forgiveness is what Jesus did. Holiness is your commensurate response. We think we can handle spiritual matters when our life has not first of all come under the radar of heaven. You don't bring yourself under the government of the Holy Spirit to walk on you. And you think because you heard somebody talk about God, you go and say the same thing and there will be a change. He said in Mark chapter 3 verse 14, He called them to be with Him so that He may send them. In a great house, there are many verses. Some unto honor, some unto dishonor. He said, any man that purges himself, any man that purges himself, he said he will be a vessel unto honor and he will be neat. He will be useful for the master's service. This is why we don't have authority even though we are talking so loud because we are not purged. We are talking holiness, the people are living in sin. We are talking sanctification, the people are living in sin. Because we ourselves, what we have not come under, how can we bring people under? If what we are saying is true, how, how come it's not affecting us? Purging, sanctification, consecration, they are more important than manifestation. Because if you are not consecrated, you will not know when even what is happening in your life is a lying wonder. That's why I say the calibrator is in the heart. If you are honest to yourself, sometimes when you come to the fellowship, you will tell everybody, please, I don't want to preach. I can't sing now. You will depart from the fire and go and stay with God to help you. Because you know what is happening in your heart. You come deceive men, but the spirits are watching. You can't lie to them. Because beyond what you are saying, they are seeing the energy that you are emitting. You are gifted, you are skilled. So men, is looking, men are looking at it, but the spirit, they check you. Jesus said, the prince of this world, come to me. He didn't come to his manifestation. He didn't come for his meeting. He said, the prince of this world, come to me and find that nothing. No wonder he entered the territory and the Bible said, light, light appeared. He said, they that were in darkness, a great light is strong forth. Because that one is a witness. His ministry has territorial implication. His ministry could bring the soul of men back to government. God is not impressed that you are running from one meeting to another. God is not impressed that you traveled for 13 hours to attend a meeting. You become useful in his hand when you purge yourself. You can travel for the meeting... And then you travel from, from maybe Enugu and you went for the meeting in Meduguri. 
and then you were sleeping on the field. I say, oh boy, we slept on the field for three days. God is not impressed. Because it's not his, his business that you are poor. There are laws of the spirit to make you rich. If you maximize it, the guy that slept in the hotel will have the same encounter with the one that slept on the field. In fact, the one who slept in the hotel, if he has more expectation, his encounters will be more. But you will be useful in God's hand to the degree that you purge yourself. So most of us who are young people now and we have a knowing that God is interested in us. Before we start running around preaching, quoting doctrine, correcting people and telling people on Facebook that this one is wrong, this one is right. Let's take our life first. Bring your life under that radar of heaven. Let God work on it. You share something on Facebook, nobody will read it and meditate. The next time you bring like this, you'll see 40 shares. The guy saw it, he didn't meditate on it, he feels it's for other people. He comes for a meeting, he hears a scripture, and then the next thing he carries that scripture to tell another person. Because him, the scripture is not for him, it's for another person. Because all of us want to create impression. Purging is too important. God is, God is urgent upon blessing you. In fact, God can't hold back to pour out blessings upon you. But God is more interested in your soul and in your eternity with Him. Will your blessing cost you your place in Zion? Judas became the keeper of the money. And the Bible will say he took from it once and again. And that became the reason why he succeeded the prophecy of being the son of perdition. So he, he received money on earth. He received the applause of being an apostle. But in Zion, he missed one of the twelve thrones that they were to see to join the twelve tribes of Israel. We need to look upon the matter of sanctification. This evening, I want to show you quickly three simple ways of engaging sanctification. Because the idea is not to paint the problem. If you tell people what the problem is, they are already aware. In fact, they are experiencing it. So you can't come and tell the masturbator, oh, Master, no, he, he, has, he is experiencing it. He is crying. In fact, he's in bondage. He's more aware than you are. <laughs> what he needs is how do I come out? <laughs> Meanwhile, everything I want to share here, they are not momentary antidotes to challenges and crises. They are things that can only be maximized through practice and consistency. Because these things are, they are, they are activated and they are maximized when they are given through process. It's not something you do one day and then you go and sleep. And then you wake up the next time you fail and do it for three days and go and sleep. Hmm. The worst thing that will happen to a man on earth is to look back in old age and discover he didn't fulfill purpose. Somebody told us a story. One old man in Kano now. He's over 72 years. So he, he, he bought a megaphone now and he works in the market. You see, repent, repent. He's screaming, but you can't even hear his voice. He is hoping that by all means he will do something. He will do. That, 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 that is supposed to be a wrong get street evangelist. Because where he began his own from is the market. But meanwhile, when he was young, he was pursuing other things. It's now that he's old, he looked back, he discovered everything is vanity. The hunger came alive, but the strength is gone. A man who begins his evangelism in the market, but he's beginning at the age of 75. The worst thing that will happen to you is to look back and discover you were supposed to be like Lawrence Sawyer. But you discovered at the age of 80. So you, were ha you started having all your angelic visitation at the age of 80. Now your room, you lift your voice and then you sing. But all the crusade, the first crusade you have, you need to travel for 14 hours. And when you travel for 6 hours, you're not faint. So when you went to that state, you woke up in the hospital. <laughs> you are supposed to be cheated very amano. You do like this, people are healed. But you discover at the age of 70. 
So you gather the meeting, you organize the crusade, the, the platform have already been set. But on the crusade ground, you woke up with backache. <laughs> Don't discover when you are old. Meanwhile, you may discover now, but the only way you can walk in it is through consecration. Ask anybody that has true manifestation, it will tell you it's by consecration. Somebody came to me and said, Oh! What's the secret of utterance? I said, I don't know. But what I know is that before I go for a meeting, if I wait before God and pray for three or four hours, every time I'm talking, I'm charging. My, my tongue becomes fluid. And meetings that I preach, I can preach something here and go for another meeting and I, maybe I didn't pray, I didn't have time to wait on God. And then I want to preach the same thing with the same scripture. I will struggle on the... I will, I will be dry. Me, myself, I will know I'm boring myself. Nothing works except consecration is first of all in place. The oil that anoints your soul for God to flow through you, it comes when you are separated unto Him. A man that chokes his soul with distraction, noise, sin and everything, even though he has three rods of healing, he can come for a meeting and he will struggle, nothing will happen. Because Jesus did not only heal by faith, the Bible says virtue flowed out of him. Virtue. Because he knows how to wait on the altar. I want to show you three things that you will practice. You will practice them conscientiously. And things will change. The first thing I want to reveal to us this evening. Is the business of the world. You see this Bible. If the devil wants to steal your destiny from your hands. It becomes the hardest book to read. How many of you have experienced it? Every time this book is no longer sweet to read, you are in trouble. You can manage for three months and you are still working with the residual knowledge that you have for three months. And then you are doing things. After three months, you discover you are rusty. Even inspiration will cease. Paul said something. He said we should take off the old man and put on what? The new man, which is renewed in knowledge. The question is how the first question is how do you put on the new man? Because it's not a cloth you go into your wardrobe and wear. And it's not something you do by Z and you say, Now I have put on the new man. <laughs> it will be a very a very loud clown. I have put on the new man. When you go into battle. Then the devil will knock you. <laughs> you know something? The new man is not just the nature of God. It is also the armor of warfare. Because that nature comes with the abilities of God to stand. If you study that scripture down, it says, give you no place to the devil. That means if you have not put on the new man, what you have done is that you have done what? You have given place to the devil. So the new man is not just the nature of Christ. Is also the abilities of God that comes upon a man. A man who has not put on the new man cannot stand in warfare. This is why most Christians now in their life is a bundle of contradiction. Not because God is not powerful or potent, but they don't know how to put on the new man. See, consecration is not zeal. It's not resolution that we do every first January. No, 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 no. It's a spiritual technology. And it is done consciously and conscientiously. It doesn't happen on its own. It is consciously programmed. And it's something you can do if you want to. That is why the Bible said, if any man purges himself. It didn't say if God purges any man. If any man purges, God has made available the system for purging. If any man takes advantage of it, he will be purged. And the first system that God puts in place for consecration, for sanctification, and for the life of holiness is the system of the world. In John chapter 1, from verse 1 to 4, the Bible began to give us the credentials of the world. It said, in the beginning was the world. The world was with God and the world was God. He said, all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. He said, in Him was life. The life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. 
That means the reason why a man can stand in darkness is because he has made contact with that light. So that light becomes the light that illuminates his life. So any man that is bound by darkness of immorality, the darkness of, 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 of masturbation, the darkness of lying, is because he has not touched that light. When he touches it, the light becomes what? A light that shines through his life. If he touches it, he becomes a, a, a portrait that reveals that dimension of God. Because God doesn't intend to be seen on earth through a cloud. God doesn't intend to be seen on earth through a thing that comes down from heaven. You know, our idea of God manifesting is to appear and then you see a mirror and then you see a head or somebody speaks and says, My son, my son. The best way God wants to be revealed on earth is through you and I. That was the original design. He didn't plan to invade in this world. He didn't plan to interfere in this world. His idea was for Adam to become the reflection of his reality. The reason why he had to come was because Adam could not reflect his dimensions. And when he came, he came in the visage of a man. So the idea of God is for you and I to reflect his dimension. So he said, in him was light. The light was what? The light of man. The light shines in the darkness. So any kind of darkness that is in your life or in your territory, all you need to do is to what? Make contact with the light. And then the light will shine through you. But how do you make contact with the light? He said he came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him. The first thing he did was that what? He gave them the legal right to become his sons. The power to become the sons of God. Even them that believe on his name. But he doesn't stop there. In verse 16. That's where the technology is. He said as we beheld him. We saw him as what? The glory of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's why I told you, if the devil wants to make you irrelevant, this book becomes the hardest thing for you to look upon. In the beginning was the Logos. The Logos was with God. The Logos was God. But some people understood that by beholding the Logos, they can see beyond the logos. They began to see the glory. So any man who cannot stay on the logos cannot see the glory. And a man who cannot see the glory cannot be transformed. That's why you see us struggling with consecration with our willpower. Your will is already compromised. Because your will is the constituent of your soul responsible for action. Your will don't take action until your mind and your emotions have concluded it. Your mind processes information. Your emotion is the flavor that gives expression to those information. When your emotion and your mind interact, your will have no choice but to obey. Now, all the information you have were orchestrated and manipulated through the dark vista of the funny world. How can you use that compromised will that is functioning based on the conclusion of the corrupt mind and emotion? To do something that is consistent with the spirit of holiness is impossible. That's why you struggle with masturbation. You want to stop by willpower. You can't. That's why you struggle with every other challenge. You can't. Because your will is compromised. The answer to your question is here. Until this is downloaded into you, the, the possibilities here cannot be uploaded out of you. So he said, as we beheld him, what did we see? We saw the glory. And Paul came to tell us in 2 Corinthians 3, 18. He said, we all with unveiled faces. Now, remember, the unveiled faces was not our responsibility. It was him that unveiled our faces. Because he said, the old covenant, which was after the order of that which came from Sinai, he said, as they saw him, they were darkened. He said, but in this new covenant, God has already removed the veil. So the believer's face is unveiled. But will he behold? That is his crisis. So Paul said, we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. So it is the Holy Ghost walking glory out of you. And all of a sudden, something begins to happen from inside out. The more you behold the Logos, you see the glory. And as you see the glory, you are transformed. 
That's why John will say, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. He said, It does not yet appear what we shall be like. He said, But when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him. If you stay here for long, a point will come, you will begin to see the Christus. And every dimension of Him you see, you become. So instead of spending three months making resolutions and struggling with your compromised will, why not sit here? Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20. He said, my son, attend to my words. Give thy ears to my sayings. Let them not depart from thy heart. Put them in the midst of thy heart. He said, they are life to them that find them. Flesh and life to all their flesh. You will you stay here? When you stay here long enough, life is built into your soul. That life becomes your operating system. Many believers have no business with this. This is why we have no power. We are philosophers. 90% of the things we say, we heard it from other people. The Elosborn said he, he began to wonder why many young people could not flow in the healing anointing. Until he began to interview them. And then he discovered two things were cardinally wrong. A young preacher came to him and said, Why is he not seeing healings in his meetings? And then he told the guy, What do you expect to see in your meeting? The guy said, I'm expecting to see healing. He said, Okay, when you pray for people, what are you looking out for? Every time the guy goes for a meeting, he wants people to fall. He wants people to fall. After people are falling, and then he is satisfied, and his expectations have gone down, then he now begins to pray for the sick. So the Lord born said, their motivations are wrong because their priorities are wrong. And they said their priorities are wrong because they don't know the mind of the Father. If they knew the mind of the Father, their priorities would be right. And they said the second thing is because they don't know the word of God. They quote people. Everything they are saying, they heard it from people. So they can't see God. You may think you know it because you are quoting from a great preacher until Christ is hit you. That's when you will discover that what you have is in your head. It will evaporize. Now, is there anything wrong in picking from people? No. There's a principle of gleaning. You learn before you enter into the waters. But for yourself, you must find the word. Even Jesus, who was the son of God, the Bible said in Luke chapter 4 verse 16 that he went into the synagogue. He picked the scroll to read as his custom was. And then you wonder why he moved in so much dimension. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 13 says, Until I come. That's Timothy now talking to a younger believer. Somebody he was raising to become an apostle like him. Until I come. He said, give attendance to reading, to exhortation and doctrine. That challenge that you have, what does the word of God say about it? You don't know one. People are struggling with addiction and then all they are doing is to call the next person that they heard the power of God is moving through his life to pray for them. And then when they come to you, they say, this person has prayed for me, this person has prayed for me, this person. Don't add me to that list. I want to get married. What does God say about marriage? He doesn't know one. Because we are a generation that is not taking responsibility. That's why we can't be consecrated. The word of God. This is the compass for your life. How much of it do you have in your spirit? This is where our crisis begins from. If you don't come under this truth, you can't obey the Holy Ghost. Because the second point in consecration is obedience to the Holy Spirit. But all your life you will struggle to obey the Holy Spirit. Until the word of God comes alive in your spirit. You will hear the Holy Ghost speak. You may think, when God, until, until the Holy Ghost brings a body. You will be aware, but you will not do it. When the word of God comes alive, obeying the Holy Ghost becomes fun. Because the word of God will release the life required to respond. That's why I said it is life. To them that finds it. This is where it begins. 
Most of us are hoping that one day God will drop something on our life and we go and conquer India. We will take the gospel to Europe. Whose gospel are you taking? The one you don't know. Obedience to the Holy Spirit is the second precursor for consecration and holy living. What we call consecration is actually the life of God, the reality of God, becoming one with it. But there is only one personality that can carry you into that reality. In John chapter 16 verse 13, he said, I have many things to say to you. He said, but you cannot receive it. He said, but how be it when the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all reality. Can I surprise you? A man that has not been guided by the Holy Spirit, even if he's calling and the mantle that he required is put in his hand, he will not know what to do with it. He can't wield it. You read the whole scripture. Everybody that made impact in this kingdom at one point or the other was dealt, was led, was handled, was processed by the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to know you are a prophet. You know, that's one of the normal things that happen in our meetings now. I don't know why. Because myself, most times, I hear myself, my God telling me to say it. I hear other senior ministers doing it. So I concluded that, okay, maybe it's what God is doing in this is after all, he's raising an army. You know. But many people told me many years ago that you are an apostle. But this apostle was a politician. My tongue was my undoing. <laughs> I will sit like this. <laughs> I can wow 10 people at the same time. And I will keep them busy for two hours. They will just be laughing and they will have all the good times. And I was a king of white lives. So I can't come, you call me. You say, hey, where are you there now? Why you not come again? I say, I, I don't understand myself. So you now assume that I'm saying I'm not feeling fine. You say, hey, yeah, sorry, rest, eh? You go do fine. I say, okay. I, why? I don't understand myself. You will not say, I say I'm sick. I don't know. <laughs> the devil knew <laughs> that this, <laughs> the mind, the tongue, was going to be a tool in the hand of God. So he choked it. I was quoting Bible, quoting many scriptures. But the tongue was a lying tongue. We did a lot of stones. People knew us and gave us names. But we knew where we were coming from. It was those days that I sat down. I said, I look at some ladies and just shake my head. So when God has said that. But we, the standard was, first of all, it's Indians. You check Indians first. And that one too, there is a little challenge. As ugly as we are. <laughs> it is loftiness. Hope you know Paul said what? If the vanity of your heart is not removed, he said even your understanding will be darkened. You that God is showing mercy for people to, uh, to accept you. You are now checking your own standard in India. When we come to Africa, we say, okay, maybe Ethiopians. And somehow, Ethiopians. Quoting Bible, but vanity, vanity here, yeah, vanity. And we thought we could handle big things by quoting Bible. A point came, we, we were able to see some little, little things happening. And then you see, you go for a meeting, you will see maybe somebody's ear open. Or you go for a meeting, people fell down. You announce your oh boy, God wants to announce us. God wants to announce us. It was later I discovered that manifestation is not the key for announcement. I now realize that announcement is actually an alarm in Zion. God blows an alarm and your name. You know, the Bible said when Jesus came down from the dealing of the Holy Spirit, he said his fame went abroad. He had not started raising cripples, but what happened? His fame went abroad. I say, oh, how? What happened? He allowed the Holy Spirit. This was the word of God. So how much of it will he study? Himself is the word. So you can be stuck with the word, but there's no obedience. You will still struggle. Jesus will walk to Jordan to meet John to be baptized. And John will say, no, no, no. 
Three days ago, I said you are the, the, the you are you are you are the lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. How will you be coming to me to baptize you? Ah, no, 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 no. I'm not worthy to untie the latchet of your sandal. And Jesus will make a remarkable statement. He says, suffer it to be so for now. That means I am not violating the law of the spiritual realm. Because the law is that without every contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. I am not ignorant of the fact of statutory positions in the realm of the spirit. But, suffer it to be so for now. Right now, I am in a school. And the Holy Ghost is the governor. And this is what the Holy Ghost said I should do for now. So even though it doesn't make sense, even to me, I will do it. Because for me to handle the power and the authority that I need to change things in the territory, I must come under government. Because anointing can heal the sick. But for light to come into a territory that is in darkness, authority must be conferred from Zion. And the only way into authority is to come under government yourself. Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And John will dip him into the waters. And immediately the Bible said the spirit drove him. That's why you know everything he was doing, he was, he was following the handwriting of the Holy Ghost. He said the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Not to be blessed or to be announced. To be tempted of the devil. When was the last time God came and said, follow me. I'm taking you to Lagos now to be tempted. You will say it's the voice of the devil. This is, ah, this is the devil, this is the devil. Before you know, you will quote 30 scriptures. You hear a man came to you and say, I was, I had 12 million. And God told me to give it out. I refused. Everything crashed. You say, no, no. God doesn't take money from people. God bless people with money. You don't know consecration. Doctrine is for everybody, but consecration is peculiar to you because it is consistent with your ordination. God sees that you are a prophet and you cannot have any tie to money. So the first thing he does, he allows you to pay the money, then he will crumble it. When that money crashes, then your, the cord between you and money is cut off. Tomorrow, even when millions come, it will not mean anything again because that cord is no longer there. He said, the prince of this world come to me and did what? He find it nothing. The gate, the key, the link between you and that thing, God scatters it. After God helped me for a long time, I now found a lady that looked like the lady of my dreams. Tall, fair, and elegant. Till tomorrow. Till tomorrow, if you see her, you say, this one is a queen. I didn't know what I spoke to her. But as I spoke, she agreed. <laughs> the, the, I'm, not, I'm very poor when it has to do with ladies. I didn't know her. As I am now, if you will say, talk to a lady. I'll, thank you, sir. Thank you. I didn't know, I can't even remember how, and I didn't know what I said to this lady, that she agreed. But those periods of my life were the happiest periods of my life. Sometimes I will come home, I'll just lie on the bed and be smiling. <laughs> Until one day, a misfortune happened to me when I met Apostle Arum <laughs> I didn't know about dealing, but it's for good. Because it was swallowing up the powers of my ordination. The energy of my soul was trafficking in her direction. I taught this lady. I dreamt this lady. Everything was about Chidera. My ener the energy of my soul was, oh God of mercy. Sometimes I will call my guys when they come. That's when I say, she will come and visit. She was clean like an Arabian damsel. <laughs> Oh, everything I lack, I saw the compliment in her. I said, thank God. If not... <laughs> you don't know when an ugly man finds a beautiful lady. 30% of his prayers have been answered. <laughs> I left the prayer meeting. I was going home. I now saw light walking out of the wall of my house. Before I marveled, what is this? I heard, leave Chidera. And you will see my power in your life. The last time I checked, power is not a function of living a girl. <laughs> because I checked the doctrine, you shall receive power. After that what? The Holy Ghost is come upon you. Hope you know that. You know, you saw the way she was staring our faith here. And then you will come. He called the brother and say, you have the Holy Ghost. So you have what? Power. So you say, be healed. The guy was healed. When you come to territorial issues, 
that power is different. <laughs> Leave Chidela. You will see my I I I my, it was as if they shot a dagger into my soul. I went home like this. I laid down throughout that night. I didn't talk. I struggled with it for four months. You don't know the cause, the cause that bind the soul of a man to the pleasures of this life. That's why many can never be mighty because they are connected. You may know all the doctrine, you will quote all the Bible, but until the Holy Ghost becomes governor, you can't see authority that can move the hand of God over eternity. He said, Leave Chidera, you will see my power. It was four months later that God Himself provided grace because I said, If you want this thing to end, you will scatter it. When grace came, I now called her. I said, God have called me to be a priest. Meanwhile, even herself, there was detachment. And from that day, if you like, be a goddess, I'm not moved. Or believe with me, sometimes for eight months, your friend Bio came to stay in my house. He said, if there is one thing I know about you, if it's one thing, God has helped you with women. <laughs> you may stay with me in my house, you will not know when I'm praying, but you can carry my phone and go and keep it for two weeks. <laughs> that was when I died. I understood that dying to flesh is not that they carry cutlass and put on your neck. There are things that your soul is connected to. The Holy Ghost will come and scan your soul very well. He will walk with you closely for a long time. When he scan your soul, your own may be money. So he will allow you to gather that money. When he reach six million, then he will say, go and give it to the orphanage. There is no doctrine that can pass that test, but that consecration is what will break your soul so that heaven can flow through you. This is why all of us can come. I can sing most of Lawrence's songs, but when I'm singing it, you may be sleeping. But if you start singing it, all the angels will begin to dance. The angels themselves will be excited. Then you see everybody dancing with the angels. You don't know what happened to the soul. It's not about the melody of the song. It's where he's typing it from Zion. What he's singing is piping from Zion. Because when God disconnected him, there was a plumb line that was connected to a height in Zion. Every time he lifts his voice, he downloads energy from that height. So a man who has not come under government, he wants to do the same thing because he thinks it's to mimic people. We cannot have authority. Did you check the last revival? One man among a million people. And then the whole million trying to be like that man. That man is the only one that has the scepter of authority. So he can raise a system. And that system will have the government of God. But outside, where the people under that system go, they have no authority. Because they never came under the government of the Holy Spirit. Some of them are still tied to money. Some tied to women. Some tied with all forms of addiction. But they didn't allow the Holy Ghost to break those things. That is where men gain power. He came to Jacob. Jacob was the only custodian of the Abrahamic blessing. The Abrahamic blessing is a blessing that blesses the whole of human race. It was a blessing that will preserve the earth realm forever. Only Jacob was on earth with that blessing. But God could not walk with him. Until he came and he broke him. Flesh God wrestled with him through the night. But when he was broken, he said, as a prince. I thought the guy was the custodian of the Abrahamic blessing. But he will not walk in it until he is broken. He said, as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men and hast prevailed. From that day, Jacob did not have need in this world. Jacob will grow old and he wants to bless his children. He didn't say, you take ten of my sheep. You take seven of my goat. He came, he said, gather around me, you sons of Israel. And I will tell you the things that will happen to you. Why? Because as a prince, thou hast power with God. This is the way of the patriarchs. They had understanding. Did you read when Isaac wanted to bless Jacob? He said, I bless you with corn and wine. What about inflation? What if the guy enters a city where there is no money? He doesn't count. He has the power to move the heavens. He said, I bless you with corn and with wine. Jacob will come and say, the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh come. Even Jesus, when he came, he respected that order. Because as a prince, the hardest part of our work in this kingdom is working with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a sweet personality, but you cannot see his labor until you are broken. He will make sure every tendency and effect of the fallen creation is chiseled out of you. Consecration. 
It's not a business of babes. That's why a lot will be in the kingdom for 30 years. They will not be editing. The church may compensate you because of gray hair and make you an elder. You are a babe in the spirit. Because if we want to test you with the, with the test of eldership, you will not pass it. The Bible said, they that are sick, he said, bring them to the elders. Carry them to our elders. <laughs> you can be in church, but you will not have authority. Brother, you want God to commit things of eternal relevance to you. That government is rigid upon your soul. And most of us have been receiving instruction for many months now, but we have never obeyed. Meanwhile, we have attended three Bible schools. Well done. By the time you are 70 years, you will discover that that knowledge remains only in your head. You can't check even your own family. But the men of old, they know what to say to their children. And their step is forever gathered before the Lord. The, the Lord of heaven himself will come and say, I know Abraham that he will command his children after my ways. What did they know? What did they enter? They understood the powers of consecration. A man can come and look upon his child and say, you will serve the Lord. That's all. You don't need an evangelist in that land. Because it was a royal proclamation. He said, you will serve the Lord. Men come and they say, you will be a prophet. You will be this. You know what it means? He tested the venoms of consecration. So he became a prince in heaven. He will look upon Judah and he say, I make you a king forever. Until tomorrow, Judah is a king. He came. Joseph brought his children. And he crossed his hand over them. Wow. And Joseph said, no, no, no. This one is senior. This one is younger. He said, I know. He said, but the younger shall be greater. What? Who talks like that? It's a man that knows the power of consecration. Every time he speaks, heaven will back him up. Because he's a representative of heaven on earth. The government of the Holy Spirit. This is where our Christianity have lost strength and power. We are quotas of scriptures. But we don't live under the dictates of the Holy Spirit. There's no consecration unless you come under government. The Holy Ghost knows your frame, so you don't need to be afraid. He knows how to begin with you. He may start with you and say every Friday, fast from 6 to 12 because he knows you are weak. If you are consistent for three months, then he will say, make you 6 to 6. After one year, then you now say, give out your best dress. Give out your phone. See, <laughs> some people think this thing is just prayer and fasting. See, prayer and fasting is very important, but it's deeper. I'm telling you the truth. As a youth copper, I was not allowed to spend my own alawi. You don't even know where God is going with your life. You are, a, you are an embodiment of contradiction. I say, serving God is so risky. Until God compensates you, you will, you, you will be confused throughout. Until God shows you mercy and then you begin to see what he was up to. You'll be amazed. Every good phone that comes to my hand, as I go for a meeting, say, drop it. And when I have touch life phone, no instruction will come. The day they give me a tap, he say, drop it. What kind of, me and my banish from using, I know I came from a poor state, but won't I use a good phone? I went to service with five suits. He said, give all out. Even my shoes, give it out. Oh, God. I heard about Bishop David Oedek. The wife just put to bed. And then he said they should empty all the money they have in the house. Meanwhile, they've not bought anything. Even the child, the food for the child was not in the house. And then you say you should give everything. I don't understand what you mean. How will the child survive? Me, I'm learning the way of faith for the child. Is the child also a student of faith? <laughs> and then today, you will come and say, how will he buy a jet? If you talk that thing, an angel may choke you an arrow on the neck. <laughs> That's why, see, don't talk about this father so. Was the end that was telling us is the error of harm. Even when they are wrong, pray for them. Because in their days, you don't know the consecration that they just keep quiet. Just bless them and pray for them. Go and relax. Allow God to judge you so. Your wife just put to bed, and then no food at all. You gave everything because God said give. There was a time when seven of them were living in the house. You just married the wife. 
and then you, your assistant pastors, all of you are living in the same house. So you must take your bath by 5.30. Whatever you are doing in the parlor, let it end by 4 p.m. Because 4 p.m. everybody has to come to the house. You don't know consecration. The secret of giants. This is where it is. They walk with the Holy Ghost until they themselves gave up. They gave up. That's why Paul will say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence. Because everything that was ever a confidence for you, the Holy Ghost will break it until you trust. The power that changes things. And if we don't journey on this path, even when we gather, our gathering will become a con congregation of competition. We can't even perceive what God is doing. And we can't transform the lives of others. Because even our message, we will tailor it to, to, to gather a lot of things to create impression. When the Holy Ghost breaks a man, that man becomes a candidate of authority. And then finally, remember, we are talking about what? Consecration. And we say consecration is like the bedrock of territorial power and authority. You know, when we say these things, sometimes it looks as if we are being extremists. It depends on where you want to go with God. If you don't want to go far, it's okay. You can live the normal life, follow the normal principles and succeed. But if you know you are a kingdom agent, know that your life will be a catalog of warfare. So the first thing you must master is the act of invincibility. Because you can't keep fighting every day. So you must learn spiritual advantages that makes you an invincible entity. Because the, the princes will come for you. The reason is because you are the one that wants to obliterate and impede their own kingdom and government. So they will come for you. Apostle Adam Yosai will tell us, he said, when you say, thy kingdom come, he said, it's not prayer. It's a statement of war. Because what you are trying to say is that the kingdom that is existing should be uprooted. Let another one replace it. The one who is the governor of that kingdom will fight you. This is why you cannot, because the powers of principalities is in the laws of the spirit realm. The principalities in themselves can do nothing, except as they understand how the laws of the spirit realm work. So if a principality wants to get you, he knows you have authority in Christ, so he will not bother himself. But he also knows that whoever you yield yourself servant to obey, the servant of him you are, whom you have obeyed. So he will come and first of all, pamper your appetite and make sure you violate the law of the spirit and then you come outside of your own covering. That is when he will fight you. And a lot of people are not taught. They think it's only demons we engage. <laughs> they are territorial commanders. See this your village. Is under serious contention in the heavenlies. You may not be aware because your own level of Christianity is give us this day our daily bread. That's beautiful. God is a father. So you can enjoy. But if it's kingdom business you want to do, a point will come where those beings will begin to appear to you. Because the kind of prayer you are praying and the energy you are emitting is, is stopping their business in their own realm. So they will check you out. They will come to you to find out by whose authority are you doing what you are doing? Who do you think you are? Why do you want to fight what they are doing? At that point, if you are not yet gathered by the Holy Spirit, your life will be a contradiction. They will make a mess of you. So if God knows where he wants to take you to, he will first of all take time to teach you and to deal with you enough so that in the days of your manifestation and glory, the devil will come to you and will find nothing. And if he finds nothing, he can do nothing to you. Even when you want to leave this world, you would have learned a law. Jesus said, I have the power to lay down my life and to pick it up. Not because I'm killed. But a man who has not allowed God to break and to chisel him, he will be a puppet, no matter how mighty he becomes among men. This is why the government of the Holy Ghost is so important. Paul said, giving no place to the devil. That's the custodian of the grace doctrine. He said, giving no place to the devil. 
because some of them come with darts. But the only way you can be invisible is when you have been gathered together by the Holy Spirit and you have become a keeper of the laws that govern the spirit realm. Totally separated unto God until only God rules the affairs of your life. At that point, you can come to a territory and you can bind a demon in the heavenlies. Nothing will happen. But if you are not yet gathered, don't allow anybody to motivate you beyond your level of faith and consecration. There are lots of motivational speakers. Don't allow anybody to motivate you beyond your level of faith and consecration. Because territorial matters, they are high kingdom matters. And only men of true consecration can do business at territorial level. And the revival that is coming is not a church thing. It's a territorial thing. This is why we must expose people to this kind of consecration. So that when God begins to raise their horn, they will be invisible in darkness. None of you here knows the level of what God wants to do with you. A day will come when some of you will become like Deborah's. As you stand and you are fighting in the spirit, you can move the constellations. The Bible said in the days of Deborah that the stars fought against Sisera. From their constellations, they were, they were partnering with the woman to fight on earth. And on the strength of that, she was able to cause mirrors for not rising for the people of God. Is that a normal human being? That's a woman that had rank on earth and in the heavens. Some of us, that is the kind of destiny God wants to bring us into. But how can we ever walk in it when we cannot commit ourselves sufficiently to the government of the Holy Spirit? How can we be that powerful when we are still regulated by different spirits in darkness? As we eat the word of God every day, the voice of the Holy Ghost will become loud in our soul. And then we move from study, from meditation, into obedience and when we keep the quota of obedience then the third part which is most significant is the part of prevailing prayer you cannot be consecrated to God until prayer is your life there is no argument about this one these three things I am telling you Check your life. They are the things that the devil fights most in your life. Because these ones, they directly impact destiny. The word of God. Less than 10% Christians do business with it. You can come home very agile and you carry the Bible you want to read. Some people even use the Bible as a therapy for sleeping. Carry the Bible to read the next thing. And they sleep off. Meanwhile, that guy walked from 8 to 4 p.m. He has energy to walk for 8 hours in a day. But he can't sit on the word of God for 1 minute. Because the devil knows that the day you start doing business with the word of God, you are directly impacting your destiny. Obedience to the Holy Spirit. One of the hardest things to do. The devil knows the day you begin to obey the Holy Ghost, you become invincible. And then thirdly, prayer. Very few men are praying. There are many preachers, but few intercessors. Many talkers, but few men that have fellowship with the Holy Ghost. This is why we have a, a million churches, a billion preachers, but we have less than a thousand believers. The idea is to raise some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, for perfecting the whole believers. Now pastors are more numerically strong than the believers. There are more preachers now than there are believers. But darkness is still ruling. Because prayer is no longer there. Nothing God does in this realm. That survives without the foundation of prayer. Go and read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Every time there is a move of God. Prayer is the first thing that goes on the ground. So when God wants to create a move, the first set of people that he raises are intercessors. Because these ones will travel beyond the status quo. They will go deep into the foundation of truth and they will uproot realities from heaven. The Bible said in Genesis 
chapter 4 how that Cain slew his brother and after slaying his brother he pioneered a new civilization darkness became the only known civilization in the world there was no hope for the move of God again God knew that it was going to be impossible even though he was sovereign the only man that was an heir of the human race had gone away from Eden he went and raised the city in north and on that side he began to create different patterns and civilizations of darkness no way that God could invade the earth anymore because Cain had blocked everywhere with institutions of darkness and the Bible says God came in Genesis 4 25 and he remembered Adam and he gave him another seed called Seth in the place of Abel that Cain slew and he says Seth gave birth to a son he called his name Enosh and he said from then the men began to call upon the name of the Lord that was the only intelligence that was able to alter the system of darkness that came pioneer God could not do anything about what came did came had raised darkness everything was darkness death came polygamy came music in darkness came the only way god could bring intervention was to start another move of prayer he said in that day did men begin to call upon the name of the lord the moment incense began to rise to heaven god had legitimacy to invade the Israel. this is where the economy of prayer becomes deeper than asking for your needs prayer becomes god's strategy of rescuing the world and preserving his heritage i was telling them the other day i said when jesus said you are the salt of the earth he was not referring to all believers he was actually referring to the intercessors the believers that know the technology of incense they are the ones that will preserve the earth because when you read through the bible every time the the, the heritage of god was preserved it was because people lifted their voice in prayer he said men began to call on the name of the lord Darkness came again and then God now said, I will wipe out the whole human race, including the animals. He said he repented God that he ever made man. Hope you know that situation was worse than is worse than our own now. But there is still hope by prayer. If only prayer can rise, no matter how pathetic the situation is, there can be an intervention from heaven. God said, I will wipe out. So there was nothing in this world that God desired anymore. He said he repented the Lord that he made man. But the Bible said God found favor with Noah. You will think Noah found favor because found grace with God. You think his favor. It has nothing to do with favor. It was when Noah came out of the ark in Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, that we understood what Noah was doing that made the searchlight of heaven to come upon him. Because the moment he came out, the Bible said, Noah raised an altar unto the Lord. So the only way that God, even after making a sovereign decree, can take it back was because a man understood how altars could change the policy statement of Zion. A man knew that by altars, heaven can still invade the earth regardless of darkness. That's why every, every revival begins with prayer. It doesn't matter the level of decadence. It doesn't even matter what God says. If men can pray, if men can raise altars on earth, then intervention can come again. So true consecration is born when men enter the womb of prayer. Because at that point, they are truly aligned to the government of Zion. Darkness came again. Nimrod rose and he raised an army and they began to build a tower in Babel. And God scattered the human race. It was now impossible for God to work with man. God himself wanted to scatter man so that there will be no unity. And if there is no unity, there is no way God can permeate that. But something happened again. He found a man and the moment he began to train the man, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 12 verse 7 that Abraham raised an altar. Our consecration will be defective unless we become men of prayer. The devil will still find a loophole in our lives and in our territory unless prayer rises up continually. The business of prayer is deeper than your needs. We were only taught to pray for our needs. It's a joke. The Bible said in Revelation 5, 8, it said the prayers of the saints are sent to heaven as others. They are stored up in golden vials. Why? So that God can spend from it. Every time God wants to do something, there is an economy in heaven that he can spend from. So God can decide to give you an encounter. Not because you are doing anything, but because in the vias of heaven, there is an intercessor that has stored that prayer bank 
with a no prayer. So God can fetch from that prayer and bring intervention. When men don't pray, the move of God dies. When men don't pray, the purposes of men are marginalized. This is why sometimes God calls a remnant and tell the remnant, keep praying. And then you are wondering why are we pray. What you don't know is that you are the one fueling heaven. So that heaven can have legitimacy to invade the earth and to make things happen. And that's why I told you that when we get to Zion, that's when you know the men that are truly mighty. Many pastors in Colos, but Paul said a pastoras, a born servant of Christ, laboring savagely for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete. So it was not the doctrine in Colos that kept the people perfect. It was the prayers of a pastoras, a pastoras. The way the earth is preserved is when men of prayer arise. So you want to be eternally relevant, prayer must become a move in your life. It's beyond going to God and asking. Somebody said the other day, hey, we said they should pray for 10 hours. He said, what will he be asking God for 10 hours? I say it's because you don't know prayer. You think prayer is about asking God. Sometimes when we pray, we want to preserve the earth. We are praying for higher matters. Sometimes when we pray, we want to bet the move of God in our life. And in the territory. You think we come because we want to ask. All your problems will be exhausted in less than 30 minutes. And you will be shocked that you have not even ascended to heaven. Because you don't even know the technology of ascendancy. The prayers of the saints. They are stored up in heaven in fires. Appearing in Zion as others. That God can receive fragrance. And on the strength of that he brings intervention to earth. Israel captivity. In Babylon for 70 years until Daniel stood up. Do you know how many people died in 70 years? Even Daniel was a political figure. But he could not change anything in the territory. Because a revival is not a function of fraternity with governmental powers. It's not a function of fraternity with church authority. It's a move of the spirit. Daniel was the president over the realm. But he couldn't change anything. Until he checked the writings of Jeremiah the prophet. And he realized that salvation should come now. What did he do? The Bible said he went. He didn't eat any pleasant bread. He covered himself with ashes. And he was on his knees for 21 days. And instantly he began to trouble heaven. He began to trouble heaven. God was restless. Until they sent Gabriel. The prince of Persia withstood Gabriel for 21 days. God sent Michael. Two angels on one assignment. Because a man was praying. A man can move the heavens by prayer. Two archangels from heaven because a man was praying. Meanwhile, you will think it was about Nebuchadnezzar. But when Daniel began to pray, that's when he knew that the intervention they need was not political connection. It was the ability to deal with the prince of Persia because they were in captivity by a prince in darkness. He prayed for 21 days. Heaven began to move. Heaven began to move. That power that is holding you bound will keep holding you until you prevail in prayer. Daniel prayed until the prince of Persia was dislocated. Most of us, we have challenge and then we stand. Uh, uh, we are tired. The guy will not rise from his knees until he saw an intervention. It's called prevailing prayer. The kind of prayer that best consecration is the prevailing prayer. You stay there until your very soul cracks and then God begins to release energy from heaven. At one point, Gabriel came to him. He said, I was caused to fly swiftly because I came to give you skill and understanding. Daniel, man highly beloved, he said, I came to give you skill and understanding. Your destiny is being frustrated and marginalized. You are crying to prophets, crying to apostles. You don't know that the key is what God has already put in you. You can't process it enough. You stay on the altar of prayer until you force things to happen in your favor. Prevailing prayer. That's how God changes things on the earth realm. Jesus went to heaven correlated, but the coming of the Holy Ghost was dependent upon their tarrying. He said, tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Jesus knew how prayer could move the hand of God even in the heights of the heavens. Well, how many of us pray today? The devil comes and deceives us. And we pursue things. And we are distracted from the things that really matter. 
You don't know that the business the devil is doing in your life is not just about you. He has your children and your grandchildren in view. Because his plans are very robust. You think the devil is only looking at you. You don't know that he has projected into the future. He is interested because he knows that your lineage is a prophetic lineage. So he knows that you are not the only one that will cause havoc. Even your children will cause havoc. So he is fighting both you to destroy you and your lineage. But men of prayer can restore things that are to be done in the future. I tell people, I'm not preaching because I love God. I'm a man of many possibilities. Many possibilities. But my life was contracted. My mom gave me up. And she contracted me on the altar of prayer. So when I came, I didn't have a choice. God was invading me from every direction. As a boy of 12 years, I will walk on the street. I say, I will not preach the gospel. The powers were so strong on my soul. It was fighting me everywhere. I will start a relationship with the gear. The anointing will break it. Nothing was working. I will say, I will not preach the gospel. I was in the club when light arrested me. Because my mother contracted me. She will pray all night and say, Lord, use this one. Use this one. You must use this one. When heaven accepted, I didn't have a choice anymore. Even though I was trying to be a vagabond, they were just laughing at me. Like Jacob, a point came when I was arrested in my own Bethel. Meanwhile, most of us, we mortgage the lives of our children. We mortgage the destiny that God has given to us by pleasure. We don't know the powers of consecration. Consecration. The power that changes things. The power that confers authority on the generation. Consecration. The power that has the ability to alter things in eternity. When men who are consecrated, consecrated rise, then an army has risen. The army, their stature is not judged by their number. Their stature is judged by their rank in the spirit. You know, Gideon thought it was a business of number. So he gathered an army. God was chiseling it. Three minutes by consecration. Three minutes. Three minutes. Because stature is not a function of number. It's a function of rank in the spirit. How deep enough will your consecration be? How willing are you to die so that God can allow his glory alight upon your life? Some of us, our voices are supposed to be triggers in darkness. When we speak, hell is supposed to vibrate, but without consecration, so there is no authority. Some of us, our eyes are supposed to pierce through darkness and tell the church the direction that it should go, but we cannot see through the darkness because even the vistas are corrupt, corrupt by all kinds of pleasure and evil concupiscence. So we can't see far. We judge men after the flesh. The men that should come into the assembly and look upon one and say, You are a prophet, you are an intercessor, and stare their ultimatum. When they come, they only see in the natural because the devil has put a blockade on their eyes. There's no consecration, so they can't see through darkness. The men that their voices are supposed to be trumpets that we are waking others, they have become ordinary preachers. Quoting the Bible without consecration, there's no power. So when they speak, they can be resisted by the spirits in the land. The borders of our habitation are bound by iniquity. Bound by the powers of darkness. Because men will not bring their life on the altar of sacrifice. When will the army rise? The army will rise when men consecrate to God. What is the quality of your consecration? We can be one million in the church. It will not move the principalities. But if ten of us we consecrate ourselves. When we speak, heaven will move. When we speak, the hand of God will appear. Because the quorum is a function of rank, not number. God is not limited to win with a few. With many, neither to conquer with few. What is the quality of your consecration? There is no hope for our generation until your life becomes a sacrifice. There is no hope for our generation until you and I are willing to pay the price of death. Because it is God that killeth and maketh alive. Before God makes a lie, he will first of all kill. If he accepts a corn of wheat, fall to the ground and dies, it abided to know. This revival is not a revival of men alone. There are angels that will partner with us. 
But with that consecration, how can you partner with your own angels? When your angels stand in his own rank, where will you appear? You have been dwarfed by all kinds of iniquity. Then the angels are waiting, but there are no men on earth. There are no men. We waste our energy in the daytime. Meanwhile, the people who should activate revival, God has numbered them. Maybe he tells this particular rank, he says, you people stand by 12 in the night, but you have wasted your energy in the daytime. So when the angels from heaven come around 12, you are sleeping. They touch you, you are sleeping. No consecration. Energy is wasted. And we want revival to come. Without consecration, there's no revival. We have God judges iniquity. We have God purges a generation so that they can gain authority in heaven. Our rank is little. We are mighty in number, but our rank is little. The fathers knew how to partner. They knew the intelligence of partnership. The revival is not a revival of men alone. There are angels mobilized from heaven. But we are the people that will partner with them. This is why we are weak and our territory cannot see light. Can you go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost? I didn't come to preach. I didn't come to raise so much dust. I only came to open your eyes to see that you may be significant but you will not count unless you consecrate. Because your own stand on earth, there's an angel standing with you. But if you don't consecrate, that alignment cannot be secure. And when the armies of heaven move, the armies of earth will not be ready. So we will be joking. We will be playing. We will be singing. And we will think it's about him. We don't know that this thing is warfare in the heavens. Take all the glory, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, you may be seated. This morning, time, time is a challenge. But the Lord will help us. It, is, it doesn't take God eternity to do that which is eternal. I want to share with you this morning something that will change your life forever. Let me tell you, it doesn't take so much. To make impact in life, it takes secrets. Only a man who understands secrets can be a victor and a ruler in this life. As important as hard work is, hard work is not so important when you compare it side by side with secrets. You should have known by now. Somebody said, humorously, he said, if it were by hard work, the Bible pushes that be the richest man in this world. So hard work, as important as it is, is nothing compared to your understanding of spiritual secrets. The day you understand secrets in the realm of God, you become a victor. You become a ruler. You become an overcomer. Most times, the crisis of our lives is a crisis of ignorance. Jesus said, rather, Peter said, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So from the realm of God, when God looks at us, we lack nothing. He didn't say he will give us. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. He said, according as his divine power, by his authority, he has given unto us. He said, pastor, he is not given to us. He will not give, it, give to us. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. But he said it is through the revelation. It is through the epignosis. It is through the knowledge of him who has come into glory and virtue. So when you see a believer struggling, God has nothing to do about it. God has done everything. A believer who wants to go ahead in life must invest to lay hold of secret. That's why I say, buy the truth, sell it not. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 32, the Bible said, They that do know their God, he said, They shall be strong and do exploit. So, exploit is a function of revelation. When a man is struggling, 
Sometimes we struggle and we think by crying, God will do something. God has already done everything He can do. The problem is the problem of ignorance. Please don't be distracted by the children. The crisis of our lives is a crisis of ignorance. He said, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. My people. Even though you belong to God and you will assume that your father has all the authority, God himself says you will be destroyed if you don't have understanding. That is a man who lacks understanding, a man who lacks knowledge, even though he's with God, God cannot help him. He said, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. That was God talking. He therefore beholds everybody who wants to receive an intervention from God to lay hold of knowledge. This is why we preach the gospel. This is why we emphasize the gospel. Because without the knowledge of God, man has no hope in this kingdom. But unfortunately, many believers lack knowledge. This morning, I want to share something with you that will make you a master and a decider of the circumstances of your lives. If you can get it, your story is about to change. And I, like the rain, let your glory fall. Like fire, like the rain. The calendar of heaven was that intervention will come to them at 
active for 100 years. But 400 years passed. 401, 402, until 430, God was in heaven. In those 30 years, many people died. They were being played, flogged, beaten, molested. Children were killed in Egypt. God did nothing. Because the people on earth did not know what to do to download the possibilities that have that season. There are many believers that promotion has been hanging on their head for 10 years, but they don't know what to do to download the promotion. There are many believers that God has broken visitation over their life, but it has lasted for years. They don't know. Every time their birthday come, they feel something is about to happen. They think something will happen until the birthday passes. Every time the new year begins, they go and make resolutions. They think because a new date has come. They think because the earth has gone around the sun, it is going to bring them new possibilities. Dates don't bring visitation. It is the wisdom, the secret, and the understanding to take advantage of those seasons that make the difference. And this is where many believers lack understanding. Somebody has been in business struggling for years. God shows up and says he's about to promote the best. The person is aware. Sometimes God sends men gracious and then prophets come to tell them this is their season. They are aware. But they look back after many years, nothing happens. A lady reaches the age of marriage. God tells her her husband is coming. She goes for meetings. Prophets confirm it that this is the season for their marriage. They wait two years, three years, four years, five years back till not yet married. Because they lack understanding. Many people can let that some them. They were supposed to be in school. But those seasons come. They don't know how to take advantage of the favor that's in that season. The season passes. Jesus, in Luke chapter 19, verse 44, he was entering Jerusalem. And the Bible said he lamented over Jerusalem. He said, Because thou knowest to the times of thy visitation. The worst tragedy that will happen to a man in this life. Is his inability to understand when God is visiting and to know what he needs to do. He will be alive, yet his purpose will pass him by. He will be alive, his purpose will elude him until he lives a wretched life and live this world without impact. The knowledge of activating cities, the things to do, they are too important. Times of visitation. This morning is another strategy. Spirit for us. We are going to enter this season, but to maximize this season, you need to know what you need to do. Because there are definite codes that are connected to every season, and only men who know how to press it can maximize it. I have seen this evil for many years. I have studied the lives of men and I have seen this season. Dead people praying together, laboring and fasting together. They go to the bush, they fast for seven days, they pray. Then later in their lives, only one of them makes it. And then the six others, you can't find them anywhere. And then sometimes they reconnect after 20 years. And then you see the same people that were praying together, trusting God together. One of them is the high flyer, the other one is still struggling with house debt. And then out of six parties, the man who knows how to maximize it now touches in the house and he calls it a bread. People you went to school with, five years, fifteen years down the line, they are flying American like they are going to their backyard. They are commanding interests everywhere, and then you see them that they struggling looking for a job, and then the man gives you hundred thousand. You see it's a bread. Some come to post and say, look at you, you were classmates. Your classmates now owns companies. He sees you. He visits your heart. He gives you a car. You call it a breakthrough. What is the difference between you and that man? He understands how to maximize seasons. There is a dimension of God that if you violate what you call a blessing is a cause. What you receive and you celebrate 
they supposed to be the things you give people every day. But the error is because you don't know how to maximize your system. We see people who allow their systems to come and go every day and they relax, they cry. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he was crying on their behalf. He said, Because thou knowest not the times of their visitation. Many have lost the times of their visitation because they don't know how to maximize the seasons of their lives. You see a young lady who is supposed to be a mother of four getting married at the age of 35. And she says, Yes, we thank God for his intervention. But if that lady knew how to maximize her seasons, Maybe she would have married at the age of 23. But when the angel of marriage visited her, she was wasting her life. At 35, she was her first child was supposed to be left in school. By the time she's 50, her first child will be 21. What she doesn't know is that even the destiny of her seed, she has robbed them value. Because when that child is supposed to be a governor, that's when the child is graduating from the university. Because the woman doesn't understand the sequence of life. Her wastefulness of her life also becomes a negative effect on her child. The time her child is supposed to be dirty and ruling over things in this world, her child is 10 years old. And then the child comes into this world disadvantaged because the lady doesn't know the times of her visitation. When God was prompting her, she thought life was pleasure. We don't understand the intelligence that is in this world. When God created the tree, He didn't need to come creating trees anymore. He put the seed in the tree. So the season of the next generation of the tree is inside of that tree. If that tree fails to produce seed, as far as God is concerned, that tree will die. That is why God destroyed the big tree. Because the tree's refusal to maximize the season is also a violation of the possibility of the next generation. He robs the next generation of their own advantage. That was the cause that ran through Israel for many generations. When men should wake up, you see boys of 30 years wasting their lives because they don't understand that it's not just about them, that the next generation to come depends on them. Not knowing how to maximize it is the cause of many people. You pray for them, lay hands on them. Them, but they waste everything that God gives them. The greatest prophet, Jesus said, they were slain in Jerusalem. He said, He lamented. He said, Because thou knowest not the times of thy visitation. For those of us who are young men, don't waste your destiny on the altar of temporary pleasure. Don't take you away from your destiny because you have no idea what was written concerning you. I want to show you something this morning. To help you to understand the blueprint of your destiny. Maybe you thought it was about your job hard. So you run around with the young people and become an area poor. You don't know you are robbing yourself of a glorious destiny. Seasons, the songs of Isaac. You see, they have understanding of the times and of the season. If you waste the season when you should be preparing, having fun, you will pay for it with your life. When Esau was supposed to be building himself, he was living for pleasure. The Bible says when he came back, he went for it bitterly, but he never received it again. Seasons, many people lose their seasons. Most of the prayers we pray now are not necessary. The crisis is because we wasted our seasons. We wasted. A woman that God made her womb to be a gift to create possibilities and dimensions in the natural that woman converts herself to become a sex worker because she wants to fix a good reborn. And then after 15, 20 years, she comes back crying to God. Her resources were mobilized from heaven 20 years ago, but she didn't understand the system. We are about to enter a new season. I need to tell you this thing so that you maximize it. The pastor can do his best by praying for you. But if you waste your 
resources, there is nothing he can do about it. Samuel said, I will not sin against God by not praying for you. But his whole labor upon the life of Saul was a waste. Because Saul was a, a vagabond personality. So even though Samuel was faithful in his office as a prophet, there was little or nothing to give up for Saul. I want to show you things that you need to do. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1. Verse 7. Jesus began to reveal to us the secret of unlocking seasons. You know, I told you the power of a season is not in the time. The power of a season is in your secret, your understanding of the secret of downloading its possibilities. Because if you don't know how to download its possibilities, you will talk about it, but it will not come to pass. Jesus appeared to me at the age of seven. I saw him again at the age of 12. And he told me he was sending me to the nation as an apostle. But God began to announce me at the age of 31. What if I rose early enough? What if I didn't waste those years? What if I committed to his government sufficiently? Men like David became national figures at the age of 17. Timothy, national figures at the age of 17. Impact in the kingdom is not a function of age. What is the quality of your relationship with God? Until you fuse to God and submit to His government, the secret of unlocking sins will not work in your life. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 7, Jesus said, And He said unto them, They came asking Jesus, When would these things be? These things that you speak about. We believe in you. We know we are part of this. But when will these things be? And Jesus said, Unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. So the key for unlocking seasons is the authority that manipulates that season. So Jesus was telling them, knowing about the season is not your prerogative. And even if you do, it's not important. The most important thing in the season is the authority that unlocks it. So every season that comes to your life, the only way to walk in the fullness of that season is your understanding of how to align with that authority. The moment you are in disadvantage with that authority, that season will pass you by. Because the key for unlocking season is locked up in spiritual authority. It is authority that unlocks it. Now, authority is different from power. You may have power to do a lot of things, but authority works in the spirit realm. You only see the manifestation in time. Power works in time. Authority works in the spirit. For we preachers, you can find yourself operating in a certain dimension for many years. You will fast, you will pray, you will give. Everything you need to do, you will remain there. Until you understand a season has come. And then that season comes with its demands. The moment you align with that season, you are shifted immediately to another level. The same things you are doing, you will do those same things, but you see a different result. Power was able to sustain you at a level, but the moment authority came, it brought promotion. So you are doing the same thing you are doing, but your results become different. We were preaching the gospel for many years. God came and told me in 2019 March, I will begin to announce you. The same messages I preached. It's not like I started preaching a new message, a new revelation. The same messages I preached that were littered everywhere, I collected some of them and put online. And in 14 days, I was rid of 17 nations. What was the difference? What has happened to the message? The season has changed. As I was entering 2019, the Lord came to me and he said, There is a temptation coming your way, don't fall. So the key for entering that level of pain and influence was not in the fact that the season was coming, it was my obedience to the instruction. He said, Don't fall. And because God helped me to stand, the same thing I had began to produce a different result. Those messages were blessing the people that were listening to them. 
but the moment the season was unlocked, the scope changed, the influence changed, the impact changed because seasons are unlocked by authority. That is why every time God wants to promote a man, the laws become different. He says, Dear me, if the righteousness of God he did, he said, From faith to faith. So if you want to advance from one level of spiritual prosperity to another, a new layer of righteousness is revealed to you. Right standing with the government of God. Many people violate the law and the protocol of righteousness. They know God wants to do something, but they fail to follow the demands of that season. Every season comes with a demand. Your obedience to the demand of that season is your alignment with the authority that unlocks that season. Jesus was in Nazareth for 30 years. They only knew him as a carpenter. 30 years. But when the season of manifestation came, the man got up from his house and went straight to Jordan. John had been baptized. Where were you? He understood seasons. And when he went to John to be baptized, John said, No, I should be baptized of you. He said, So far it to be so for now. Just it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The power to unlock that city was locked up in the demand. This is where a lot of mistakes pay. We come to church, we sing, we worship God, we cry, we give up, we give sin, but we don't know the things that promote us. If God wants to promote a man, He brings a new quota of righteousness. The moment you walk into it, you have activated that authority on your behalf. Suffer it to be so for now. That was Jesus, the Son of God, speaking. He didn't say because I'm the Son of God, every time I want to save the world, I will save the world. There were many blind people in Nazareth. He didn't heal one. Many people he didn't heal one. He was still the Son of God. But he said, so far it to be so for now. As if it was not enough. He allowed John to be called into mediation, but it's an economy in the spirit realm. Some of the things you call harassment, it was God working on you. In 2016, I didn't know that my season was closed. And God led me to my friend's church. My friend, we lived together in the same house. And as I started fellowshipping with him, I said, okay, well, let me just stay with you here. They said, I have a meeting that I can fellowship with you. And if there's anything I can do, fine. Both of us were submitted to a person of your son. Both of us live in the same house. My friend carried me to the Osho unit. I said, John the Osho, that in this church we grow from the from the we grow through the ladder. <laughs> Both of us were ministers in Redland. Because I said I will go to church on Sunday morning. My own friend said, we grow through the ladder. And he carried me and I put me in the Osho unit. I have I had my master's degree. At that time, we are not even graduated from the university. I have my master's degree. And he was on the campus church. And we come to church and stand at the door. Welcome to the house. Give me people. When they have their convention, and people come for Remnant, Remnant, there was a minister. And we stand in front of the way these guys are standing like this. The Remnant pastors will look at me. What's happening? What, what's going on here? That's when you will know that promotion is not about coming the Bible. Promotion is not about talking God. Promotion is the quality and the texture of your yieldedness to the government of the Holy Spirit. Stay there. One year, six months, eight months, I was a motion in my friend's church. For those five years, eight months, when the church closed, I went. He does all his leaders with him and carry his bag and follow him. And we go to the house and we become friends. When we go home, we become friends. One year, eight months, my own friend. Lord, what is this? I didn't know what was going on. I died many times. Until a point came when it became normal for me. I was doing the wrestling work, I was having fun. At first, I was conscious of the fact that I'm a graduate, I'm a master's degree holder. But the point came, I didn't remember it anymore. At first, I was conscious, come on, why would I be serving these children? The point came, I didn't remember it anymore. I didn't know that that period that the Lord was dealing with me, He was reorganizing my soul to be able to handle glory and power. 
Most of the things you call embarrassment, they are schools of the spirit. Those are the things that will help you maximize the seasons that are opening over your life because seasons are activated by authority. When those seasons were gone, even himself knew that it would be a sin for me to continue with what I was doing. And I passed the test. I passed the test. As the seasons are unlocked today, most of you will leave here and go to your shop. And there's something we have to walk in for it. The Holy Ghost says, keep quiet. You will not be aware that it is the texture of your obedience that unlocks the powers of his sin. Most of you will go to your office a lot of crisis. You want to go, you want to act, and the Holy Ghost says, come down. You keep quiet, you are dying. You are dying. Because the possibility of that season will only walk through the weakness of your spirit. And that's what the Holy Ghost is desperate to teach you. And if you fail to pass the test, even though the prophecies are come forth, the season will resonate over your head and never enter. The laws to activate the season. To activate the season is very easy. It's very easy. Because the authority to unlock the season is has now been given to us in the name. Anybody that knows how to invoke that name can unlock the season. But walking in it is a control of obedience. So as we unlock the season this morning, as we go back, your path to maximizing the season is in your obedience to the utterance of God and the prophetic instructions that keep coming from the altar. Sometimes God wants to unlock the season and He gives a man a, a, a demand and the man fails. Did you read the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 22? God promised Abraham many years ago that he would be blessed with all things. All things! Here was Abraham, he had given birth to his son. The 25 years, the teaching was just to help him learn the way of faith. So Abraham learned faith for 25 years and God was not moved. God didn't say, okay, you are growing old. God was where he was. When Abraham succeeded in learning faith, he gave him a child. But the greatness had not come. The only way he was going to walk into that greatness was to pass the demand of the season. And when Isaac was grown up, he said, take thy child, thy only child, whom thou lovest, and offer him to me as a sacrifice. What? How? What? Is that his name? You promised me this child. I waited for 25 years. Now this child is growing. So all together we'll be around 35 or something years. And then you now come and say, I should go and kill this child. This is the voice of the devil. Have you not been in that situation where you were trusting God for a particular amount of money? You were trusting God for money and then the money came. The moment the money came, God now said, take that money, go and put it on the altar. <laughs> see why many people remain small. They come to church, they see the rich giving like foolish people. They say it's because they are rich. No, they are not giving because they are rich. They are rich because they are giving. The farmer will keep the little he has and remain little. Even when God is speaking, he's thinking of the money he wants to buy. That's why he remains at the level of money. But the rich man understands the law. All he has, God said, give the rush and drop it. And then this year he gave 1,000. Next year he gave 10,000. The next one he gave 100,000. The next time he gave one million, and then he calls this immediate. Because they have money, that's why they are showing. Keep your own there, and you will remain with that change you have for 30 years. The law of activating system is the law of obedience. <laughs> Take thy child. The instruction didn't make sense. Abraham knew if he told Sarah that day, the family will scatter. So there was no need to tell Sarah. He managed with the child from the house to say we are going to worship God. And in Genesis 22, verse 5, even the men that walked with Abraham, he didn't tell them. Abraham told them, We are going up to worship God. Because even the gods will stop him. They will say, No, this kid, no, it's not God. He didn't even tell the gods that followed him. He went to the mountain. And when he was about to kill the child, then God speaks from heaven. He said, Now I know. What do you mean, now you know? Are you not the one they call the omniscient God? I thought you knew everything. But the man needed to be tested in order to qualify for the season that was opening. He said, now I know. 
Now I know that thou fearest me. And he said, God swore by his name that he blessed him. I will bless you. That was the same thing he told Abraham over 35 years ago. Now Abraham is about to enter because this is where he was able to demonstrate the quality of obedience that will boast that dimension. Now I know that you fear me. In blessing, I will bless you. And in Genesis 24, verse 1 to 2, the Bible said Abraham was old and stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed him in all things. Is it not funny that we have Christians now? We are all thinking Abraham blesses a man. And we seek him for 20 years and still blessing our lives. Abraham blesses a man. We think spiritual things are things. We want to rob God. He said to the free world, I will show myself free world. When you want to show God you are crooked, he will keep you there for a long time. The quality of your obedience is what the time the seasons you can activate. Now I know. What are those things that God have insisted you do that you have been used to do for the past five years? That is why it looks as if prophecy is not working. The prophecy has worked again and again. You have failed to take delivery because your obedience is lacking. He said, when your obedience is fulfilled, then you can avenge other disobedience. We are raising a generation of Christians that have no regard for the authority of God. The God you have no regard for his authority is the God you are hoping to bless. This is why we have crisis every day. This season that is about to be open, you can open up different dimensions of this season every day of your life. There are times when in one year we notice three, four, five, six promotions. Because you know God is light. I don't want to enter into quantum benefits now because I've seen young people. God is light. This light you are seeing, you think is just straight. Life is not a continuum. Light is in packets. In packets. We call it quantum. But the frequency of the release is too high. That's why you think it's a ring. It's actually dispensed in packet. Everything God wants to give you comes to you in packet. But you determine the frequency by the secrets you understand. Because God is light. If God gives you everything he wants to give you now, he will destroy you. He says, I will not drive out your enemy in one day. Because if I do, the land becomes desolate. And the beast will come in and devour you. So the degree of your enlargement is what determines the volume of blessing you can accommodate. And your enlargement is not to charge. It is the secret you apprehend. Every city you enter, you can maximize it at will, depending on your level of understanding and quality of obedience. The way to maximize the season is to take advantage of what the authority of God anchors on. And the authority of God anchors on the name of God. This is, remember the Bible said, God swore by his name that in blessing, he will bless the ground. The authority of God resonates on the name of God. The name of God is the seal of his authority. Listen, in the natural realm, we use names for nomenclature, we use names for identification. But it's different from the spiritual realm. So if I say, oh, well, my friend will say, yes, well, can I help you? Because he thinks that name is to identify him. But in the spiritual realm, names are deeper than identification. Names in the spirit are signatures of authority. So the signet of authority of a man in the spirit is designated by his name. So the authority of God is locked up in the name of God. Every time a man through obedience enters a city, then his understanding of the authority of the name of God becomes a tool for continually unlocking the dimensions and the possibilities of that system. But unfortunately again, many believers don't understand the weight of the name of God. So the guy is going in the car and the driver breaks, say, Jesus! 
And the Jesus he caused was out of fear, not out of revelation. The first thing I have told you this morning is what? Continuous obedience as a precursor for entering into the season. The second thing I want to show you now is using the name of God by revelation as a key of maximizing your season. Because by true obedience you enter the season, by your revelation of the name of Jesus, you begin to maximize the season. Remember, when God wanted to bless Abraham, He said, your name shall no longer be Abraham, but Abraham. So everywhere Abraham went, he began to utter a new kind of name. I am no longer an assumed father. I am now the father of kings. So that name was the witness of the new thing God wants to begin to do in his life. So as this season is unlocked, if you go back and then you are talking the things we were talking yesterday, even though you are in a new possibility, you cannot maximize it. That's why God comes to a man. He said, I will make you great. Or he tells the man, you are great. And the man goes back, he's lamenting about the crisis of yesterday. He has not entered into the reality of today. The moment he enters into the reality of today, he begins to confess to me the way God says it is. That was how God created the world. When God was creating the world, everything God created in Genesis chapter 1, it did not appear. It was in Genesis chapter 2 that most of the things he created began to appear. And I will show you from the Bible. The Bible says God brought forth the green plant and it came out of the ground. And in Genesis chapter 2 verse 4, the Bible said God had not yet made man. So there was no green vegetation of the land because there was no man to tree the ground. So what God said, where did this leaf appear? He saw it in the spirit. As this season is proclaimed over you, it could be declared to be a season of abundance. So when you get hope, it doesn't matter what you see. The moment Abraham was able to see it, he began to call himself Abraham. And the Bible said in Romans chapter 4 verse 18, he said he staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief. He was strong in faith, giving thanks to God. What was he doing? He was saying what God said. Imagine if you were in Abraham's generation and a man of 100 years who is impotent. Now wakes up all of a sudden and says, now I am father of king. I am father of king. You will say, oh, this crisis has made him mad. Ah, this thing has affected him. But he understood how the realm works. He knew what the realm was. So he called his circumstance what God calls it. That's how you minister in the spirit. You come to somebody who is sick. Obviously the person is sick. But when you come, you will not say you are sick. You say you are healed. Because you are calling what God calls. And the moment faith is released, the person becomes what God calls. So the name you call your circumstance is the result you will have. When you enter a season, it becomes important that your utterance change. Most of you seasons have come and gone. There are some who have even entered, but you have not walked in the reality. Because you talk your circumstance, you don't talk what God says. Every season God unlocks. The potentials of those seasons are locked up in the name. This is why the children of Israel have many names for God. Every dispensation had a name for God. Ever had me and God came and said, Yes, truly you are dead, but I will give you a child. So he now saw a God that had the ability to provide all his name. And he said his name is called El Shaddai. So when they related with God, they related with God based on the possibilities they see in Him that was available for their citizens. He was in need, he was in lack, he was in want. And then here comes the Spirit and say, I will provide all you need. They now began to call that Spirit the multi-breasted one. So every time Abraham went before God, he said, the multi-breasted one. The multi-breasted one. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob called God El Shaddai. And this is why they could not lack in their lives. Abraham needed a child. The El Shaddai gave him a child. Isaac was in Gera. There was poverty in the land. People were running to Egypt. He wanted to run to Egypt. God said, stay still in this land. And Isaac began to relate with the El Shaddai. Isaac dug well in the dry ground. And the El Shaddai made water to come out of it. So long as he was calling El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, 
everything he needed was financially provided because he knew that the potentials of that season was locked up in the understanding of the God that provides all things. So he said, El Shaddai. These guys knew this secret so much that even when they blessed their children, they blessed them with those names because those names were like cactus that hosted all of those dimensions. So Jacob would bless his children and say, El Shaddai bless you. Adonai keep you. All of them mean different things. Adonai means Lord. El Shaddai means supplier. So when he wants to supply, he says, let the supplier bless you. When he wants to preserve, he says, let the master, the Lord, keep you. They understood the place of utterance. A new season is coming upon your life. It's important what you say. Because your obedience will be complete, but your language will be wrong. And if your language is wrong, everything that is available, you cannot quantify. Israel, when, in, when going out of Egypt, and there was war, there was no way they could conquer their enemies. Their enemies were stronger than them. And instantly, God gives Moses wisdom. He says, sit on the mountain. And so long as we you lift your hand, Israel will conquer. And Moses was there, his hand lifted. And so long as the hand was up, Israel was winning. His hand come down, Israel loses. Aaron and Hall had to support him. When the battle was over, they now changed what they called God. They began to call him to go and listen. Because that season, what God was doing for them was to cover them like a banner. So their utterances were consistent with the possibilities and provisions of the season. So when you are blessed, be sensitive to hear. Don't be religious. Believers come to church, you are blessing them, they are doing like this. They think it by closing their eyes and nothing happens to you because you are gesticulating. You need to understand the secrets that bind these things and make them happen. You will hear a man of God come and say, this season is a season of divine health. But the person didn't hear what God said. He goes back, he falls sick and he struggles with trying to What did God say about this season? The Israelites knew it, so they carried it as their heritage. Every time they laughed, they went to invoke the name. So when Isaac was blessing Jacob, he didn't bother to give him a facet. He said, I bless you with corn and wine. The name he gave Jacob, anywhere Jacob goes to, that name can produce corn and wine. They are no regard for inflation. I bless you with corn and wine. So he gave him El Shaddai. And this was Jacob. Wanting to bless the sons of Joseph in Genesis chapter 48. And he began to talk to them about the same El Shaddai that appeared to him. These are things how these guys walked. They understood spiritual laws. They had mastery over secrets. But the believer talks anyhow. Today, somebody gives you 10,000. He says, I am blessed to thank God. Tomorrow, he needs money. Money doesn't show up. He says, Wait till they have it everywhere. Ah. How can the mouth that bless cause? How can the fountain of fresh water bring salt water? So we choke our possibilities. And we are not taught. So we don't understand the power that is on the tongue. He said, Life and death is on the power of the tongue. He said, They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The fruit is what you say. It becomes a reality. The need for the season must become the banner over your life. The need. Why do we call Jesus Savior? Because in the season of salvation, God was no longer coming to us as Jehovah's support. He was not coming to us as Jehovah's Lord. He was coming to us as Savior. So the name of God that the angel introduced to Mary, he said it shall be called Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So the reason he was called Jesus was because salvation had come. So the name was consistent with the season. Everybody that through obedience follow salvation demand, which is to believe in his heart and confess the same. And as you are saved, then you carry the name Jesus everywhere you go. This is why we call Jesus every time there is a name. Because we know that the name Jesus has the power to invoke salvation. But if you don't understand that everything God wants to do, and all the abilities of God are locked up in the name, 
you will talk the way you choose to talk because you don't understand that your greatest security is in your world. Your greatest security is not in the hands of the military, it is in what you say. But many don't understand. Seasons. A season is about to open over us, and the first demand of that season is to be careful to obey everything that that season dictates. The season may dictate that for you, begin to give liberally. For you to maximize that season, giving must become your life. The season may demand that for you, no quarrel, no argument, no backbiting, no cursing. Not, so long as you obey the demand of that season, everything that season has become for you. And the season will demand that for you is prayer and fasting. The season will demand that for you is investment. If you violate the demand of that season, even if God appears in your bedroom, it will not amount to anything. This is what believers don't know. A lot of people have encounters. They see angels, they see light. And then they think that because they saw light, their life will change. Your life doesn't change because you saw something. It is your obedience to the law that that spirit brings that changes your life. Many believers are lawless. And it's a time for us to come back to find out what it is that God is demanding of us. This season that, that is going to be unlocking over us in a few moments, it will come with demands, I assure you. Most of you may go to your house and it will become difficult for you to cost it. Most of you may go to your house, it will become difficult for you to correct. Most of you may go to your house, those things you wanted to give that you couldn't give, if you don't give, you will not sleep. Because for you to enter into the fullness of the season, you must become liberal, you must become meek, you must become kind. These are the laws that come with your season. And if you obey those laws, everything that season has to offer will just be happening to you. You will sit in your house and you say, ah, you say that God loves me too much. You are the one who will money. See, there are people that since daybreak today, they have received more than 10 alerts. Not because they supply goods and services. Through obedience, they have been strategically positioned in a place of blessing. Some people, they believe really, their back is run down it's because of vibration from alarms. And all of us are sons of God. What is the difference? How did they get there in life? It is by progressive obedience. Every time you violate instruction, every time you violate the demands of a season, every time you violate the instructions of God, you are setting yourself up to be small. The reason we struggle, the reason we are small, is not because our God is weak, it's because our obedience quarter is not clean. We need to consciously begin to find out. I told us that Paul was the last of the apostles. So naturally, by chronological order, he was supposed to be the least. But if you study the operation of the apostolic and even their contribution in the scriptures, you discover that Paul was greater than them all. When Paul met Jesus, Paul said, Lord, what will you have me do? He knew that a new season had come in his life. He was going in a certain direction. But God had activated the new system. And instantly by the spirit of wisdom, Paul didn't tell Jesus, what is this thing for me? That was the question Peter asked. He said, we have left all and followed you. What is in this thing for us? There's nothing wrong in demanding from God. But there is a higher kind of request. For Paul, when he met Jesus, he knew a new system had come. He said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And Paul became the greatest of all the apostles. There are two questions we will ask this morning. The first question is, Lord, as you open this season, what will you have me do? It doesn't matter whether you are young or old. When a spirit brings a question of obedience, age is not a factor. Because it is the supply of the spirit that will make the difference. Age is not a factor. Most of the men that are shaping their world today, if you read their story, they began when they were 18 years old. In 1979, Bishop David Oedepo called the whole Nigeria for a three days fast. He is about 66 today. In 1979, how can a young boy like that have the audacity to think he can call Nigeria for a fast in a military era? 
So when he is speaking with authority today, he is not speaking with authority because he is an old man. He understood those secrets when he was young. David was not shaking Israel because he had become an old king. At the age of 17, David could confront Goliath. So age is not what makes the difference. It is the extent to which you know the spirit that is calling you into depths. Most of us, the Lord calls us by different kinds of instruction. We violate it. The reason we pray so much and we have so little is because we don't understand that our result most of the time is locked up in our obedience. Jesus says, seek me first the kingdom. Every other thing shall be added unto you. So Jesus didn't even ask us to pray for food. He didn't ask us to pray for prayer. He said that is what a beggar is doing. You know who is a beggar? A beggar is not a sinner. A beggar is a devotee of a religion. A beggar is a religious man. He said they are the ones that ask for clothes and ask for bread. He said the lilies of the field. He said that beautiful and mighty as Solomon is, is not as arrayed as one of them. He said your heavenly father knows that you need this thing. So what then is the cure for lack? What then is the key for abundance? It's not necessarily prayer. You may pray and receive, but it's not necessarily prayer. It is obedience to the demands of the government of God. A man of obedience is a man of abundance. Abraham did not pray once for bread. He didn't pray once for cattle. But he lived a life of continuous obedience. And when Abraham was old, the Bible says the Lord had blessed him in all things. Our obedience quota in this season is very important. In the moment we are going to bow our heads and ask the Lord, Lord, we have come to another season. What will you have us do? I have come to another season. Will this one still be another calendar year? God forbid. What will you have me do? There is something you need to do because you know that your success story depends on the things you do. It doesn't take God anything to change our story. It takes God nothing. You may sit down and calculate and say, Kai, this is my dream. When will I get there? As I am now, all I have in my bank account is 10000 How will I get there? You don't know how spirits work. If God wants to orchestrate a change in your life, it's mysterious. You can step out of your house in your job barracks and your primary schoolmate just shows up driving on the street. And then he tells you he came from America yesterday. Why he came to Nigeria, he doesn't know. What are you doing here? He said, oh boy, see me. He said, no, 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 no. You mean you? They go, they go. He said, oh boy, see the go now. And they go with this one. He said, no, 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 no. Papa, they go. He said, Baba, Baba, they go. You will go home, boy, of this one. He said, no, 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 The next thing he carries you to a car stand and say, pick in the car. Ah! Your budget could not imagine car. Even if they told you to imagine yourself driving a car, it would be hard. Your brain can't capture it. But that's how mysteries work. The Bible says the step of the righteous is ordered by the Lord. There's a place for your abundance, but only by obedience can you walk there. This is what many violate. So they cry, praying and begging God. Meanwhile, God has given the formula. He says, seek ye first the kingdom. All these things shall be added. So we seek things instead of seeking obedience. This is the crisis of our lives. This morning, we are going to ask God. The biggest things that God do for you are not the crazy things you see. The biggest things God does for you are the things He walked into your spirit. That's why men become invincible. You see a man walking in blessing every day of his life. You say, how is this thing happening? Even if the negative supernatural they know, if you like, go and seek a witch doctor today. There is no spirit that gives to a man without obedience. Every spirit walks by laws. And when God makes a declaration, the manifestation is tied to your obedience. Manifestations don't just come to pass because God decreed. They come to pass because men are willing to obey.
This morning we will ask a question. Lord, what will you have me do? What will you have me do? If you know what to do, you will get what you should. Lord, what will you have me do? That's our prayer this morning. And as we depart from here, God gives us instruction, either through His Spirit or through His servant. As we live, we will speak it. The Bible says, carry with you words. Carry, carry words. Why do you think the elders of old were so bold? A man will come to you and say, before I bless you, go and bring the best medicine. What do you mean by that? A man wants to bless you. He says, go and empty your bank account. Are you okay? The man knows that every word you speak is more important than your one billion in your account. So he wanted to bless his son. He said, go and get me this. Let me eat and then my soul can bless you. That man knows what he carries. This is why great men don't throw walls around. They know that their walls have the power to change things. As you live here and God gives you the instruction, carry it as your insurance and keep speaking that word that God tells you to speak. For Abraham, he said he was strong, giving thanks. He was speaking in the direction of what God spoke. How many of us have declared that we are sick? You just sense headache, and the next day you have told 30 people already, I am sick, I am sick. You will never say, I am healed. Go and take your drug, but never say, I am sick. The Bible says, let no man in Zion say, I am sick. He said, when men are cast down, he said, say, I am lifted up. He didn't say, when men say they are cast down, men are actually cast down. He said, when men are cast down, don't talk casting down, even if you are down. When you are down, that is when you should talk up. As you leave this season, speak according to the demands of the season. When you obey the laws of the season, then talk what the season says. Never speak what God is not saying. You will set yourself up. And even God himself will be helpless on your matter. He said, my people, my people. He didn't say strangers. He said they are destroyed. If they are your people, why do you allow them to be destroyed? For the lack of knowledge. That means God tried to help them, but they can't. The Lord tells them, I want to bless you. But they go out and they say, not in the work. Going to increase you, they go out and they say nothing they walk. Every time God tries, God cannot reach out to them because they use their voice and their mouth to destroy what God is creating. Every season has laws, and the secret of downloading the potentials of the season, they are simply two. One is obeying the demands of that season, two is confessing the possibilities that is revealed in that season. And you will discover that your lives will change. Do we bow down and talk to the Lord this morning? This morning I came with very simple instructions so that everybody can understand. If not every day we teach mysteries and we talk uh, deep spiritual realities, I try to say it in a simple way this morning so that if you don't remember anything, when next you go to your shop, and you want to gossip and you lose your peace, know that the law of the season is what is confronting you. When next you want to malign somebody's name and you lose your peace, know that it's the law of the season. When next you want to rebel and you lose your peace, know that it's the law of the season. It may be something you want to do, but remember, the more you go in the direction of disobedience, the more you make your life difficult. When next you want to talk fear, know that the season does not permit it. When next you want to talk unbelief, know that the season does not permit it. If you know what to do, you will have what you should have. The problem of many people is because their life is not gathered together by laws. The problem with most people is because their tongue is not controlled by laws. They just talk what they feel and they do what they like. Men of honor don't behave like that. It's only animals that, that do what they feel like doing. 
So a goat sleep with the sister because he felt like having sex. A goat sleep with the mother. A goat gets off and faces this direction. It talks this direction. No law around his life. That's why it's an animal. But the Bible says a man in honor that knoweth not is like a beast of the field that perishes. Our life must be gathered and connected together by laws. Every season of your life has laws. Every season. I have fasted and prayed for many years. But this season that I am in, only one thing God is emphasizing. Concentration. Concentration. So I know that I have to keep retreating every week. And if I don't obey and that instruction is lifted, then everything that God brings for me this season, I will lose it. It's not enough to say I fasted for 10 years. This is God is saying, wait upon me. Wait upon me. If you violate it, you will discover that the thing you were doing and seeing results, the point will come, it will become like chaff. Chaff. You were seeing it. people were crying, falling everywhere. God comes and said, there is a new season. Wait upon me. Wait upon me. Then you are busy, you are running there and there. And then you come to church, you shout. Nothing happens anymore. You become like child. Because the power is not necessarily what you are doing, it's in the supply of the spirit. And we ask the Lord this morning, Lord, what will you have me do? What will you have me do? I didn't come to speak to everybody. I came to speak to the people that this season is truly for. The people that will truly maximize this season. And they will have testimonies. That will blow their minds. Testimonies. Testimonies. What will you have me do, Lord? Talk to the Lord in the privacy of your heart. In the privacy of your heart.
most of us here, those areas of disobedience, the Holy Ghost will begin to show you. Those are the reasons why God can't bless you. Those are the reasons why you can't move forward. The Holy Ghost will want you to remove that disobedience and drop it at the altar this morning. So check your soul very quickly. That's the first surgery the Holy Ghost will do this morning. I will pray for the sick. But the first surgery is in the soul. As it was, maybe you have disobeyed for a long time. The Holy Ghost wants to show you now. Those areas, those are the things that have been that you from moving forward. Sometimes you make the work of pastors very difficult. Fasted, prayed, come to prophesy. But the people will not follow the Holy Spirit. You reign, you ancient Zion's king. You have seen an area of disobedience. The Holy Ghost have, have shown you. Flashed it, flashed it. You know. And you know what? That disobedience will become the reason why you will not enter into the fullness of this system. You want to rededicate yourself. You want to recommit to God. And say, so God, as you help me, I will obey. Listen. When it comes to God, all of us, we are like dust. You may be big among men, not before his spirit. Some of us, the area of predominant disobedience is pride. We can never say, I am sorry. Never. And then we choke our soul, and God can flow through us. Pride. Because we don't have the right estimation of the God we are dealing with. This morning, you are here. And there's that area of disobedience that has prevented God from pouring out Himself to you. And the Holy Ghost has shown you this morning. I'm not calling any case, I'm not calling any no. And you want to drop it at the altar and say, Lord, I cast this on the altar. Come forward, let me pray for you. You have seen an area of disobedience. Come and place it on the altar very quickly. We'll be out of here in no time. That's the first thing the Holy Spirit will have to address this morning. Those things that have prevented you from entering into the fullness of what God wants to do in your life. Sometimes we think because the man of God lays hands on us. Because the man of God prophesied things will change. Things are not magical. They are definite laws. The reason we think things will just change is because we are not well taught. You will change your life after 10 years. At best, you will only be surviving. Hallelujah, glory to the Lamb, glory to the Father, you are seated on the throne. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to the Lamb, glory to the Some of us, the things we were supposed to enter 10 years ago, we have not entered into it. This decision we are about to make this one is what will change the story of many people. Sometimes the most powerful meetings are not the meetings where people lay down the floor. 
we see that every day. I minister predominantly on campus. You see people in their hundreds on the floors. Even demons running out of people. But most times their lives are not changed because they don't make decisions. Spirits walk with you from the point of your decision. Because he wants to hold you responsible. You are still in the congregation this morning. The Holy Spirit Himself has shown you an area of disobedience. I have been calling on you to come out now. Before we pray for these people, I was not the one that told you. God Himself will build into your heart. I didn't say if you are masturbating, come. I didn't say if you are lying, come. If there is an area of disobedience, and the Holy Spirit has shown it to you. Place it on the altar. Tell the Lord, this is it, this is it, this is it. This is what I struggle with. I bring it to you. He said, Whoever calls on me, I shall in no wise cast away. The law is to call upon you, is to cry, is to beckon upon the Lord. It may be lying, as simple as it is. It may be fornication, it may be anger, it may be pride. That time when God wants to visit you, that's when that fornication will intensify. Every July you find yourself on this. You are strong from January to July. Because the devil has seen that that's the window of your life. You think you have just seen and asking God for forgiveness. You don't know you are treating your destiny. Drop it at the altar. When God wants to do something new in your life, that's when anger comes and spoils everything. You see, they don't want to be go. Not only then, God day. Who told you God day? The God day you are calling, that's the God that you are sent in the person. But you mess it up all the time because of anger, arrogance, and pride. Listen to the God. Tell the Lord, I can't help myself. Help me. He said, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't allow anything to rob you of your destiny. Nothing is. Big enough to rob you of your destiny. Go into the feet of the master. At the feet of the master. At the feet of the master. Yes, 
God. There's nothing you can do for yourself. That's why you have a Savior. You want to live in the house of a Savior. You try. Never know your time. But you don't need to try. You need a Savior. Now you rely on the Savior.
be disrupted. This is not the time. Bless your Holy Spirit. Look upon your people right now. Look upon your people. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I declare from the left to the right, from the front to the back, Holy Spirit, touch them. Come on, let's go. 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 Come on,
Holy Spirit in a moment, you can play just the keyboard. Play the keyboard. Focus on the Lord.
There's a prophetic angel walking with you. There's a prophetic angel walking with you. Yeah. You know things before they happen. And when something happens, I said you've known it before. Have you had those experiences? You've had those experiences. Don't allow the devil use this to take you away. It will destroy you. You don't have a place in the world. You don't have a place in the world. Just take your hands toward them. Let me have the Lord to release the anointing of your calling upon your life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Even as you point anything out, Lord. Right now, Lord, I release virtue. I release virtue. I release virtue. Holy Spirit, rule upon him now. Rule upon him now. Let the anointing well upon his inside. Let the anointing well up. I stand. I stand in the name of Jesus. I stay in the name of Jesus. Let it flow like a river. Like a river. Like a river. I stay. I unlock it. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.